Radio, where gamers roll. Hello Gammon Nation and welcome to The Forge, a Genesis role-playing game podcast covering everything that you need to know about the latest and greatest from Fantasy Flight Games' all-new Genesis Foundry and of course, the Genesis role-playing game. I'm your host, GM Hooley, and welcome to our first episode. Now, I could chat with you all about this exciting new development that we've only heard a few hours ago from Fantasy Flight Games uh, for hours on end. But I think that'll be pretty boring and it'll be much more fun to do with a friend. You hear him on every episode of the Order 66 podcast. He's known as a connoisseur of gaming goodness, a man of impeccable tastes, and basically he's just a damn nice fellow to have around. Let me introduce you to the person who will be joining me on this wild adventure here at The Forge, my co-host and friend, GM Chris. How's it going, my Texan brother? And freaking tastic, my Aussie brother from another mother. <laughs> I uh, I am excited to be here. I'm even more excited to know that as of yesterday, the Genesis Foundry is live. Oh, I know, and filled with superb new Genesis content, Indeed. which um, it kind of leads us to the point of this little podcast, doesn't it, Huli? It, it certainly does. Oh, Huli, my Huli, <laughs> just uh, what. What 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 is this podcast all about? Can you can you embolden and enlighten our listeners? I can certainly do that. So this podcast is going to be all about the amazing options that Genesis presents uh, to build custom content and uh, you know new material that will excite pl- both players and GMs. Uh, it's about bringing our most fevered dreams um, onto the gaming table, basically. Um, now, yes, we're going to focus on creating your own settings, your own archetypes, careers, talents, skills, gear, and threats, um, but we'll do so with a strong focus on the expanded and new content continually available on the Genesis Foundry. Now, we're, we're also going to help you to understand what to look out for, uh, what, basically what's going to be cool, what's going to be great. And effectively, the, the must-haves, both as um, someone who's going out to purchase the products, uh, as well as someone who may be developing it for themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, you can expect regular special guests um, from the industry, um, a few of which we have on the show tonight. Um, <laughs> yes. but, uh, but we'll get into that shortly. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll not only discuss our Foundry content, but the process of content creation as well. Uh, so additionally, you can also count on us to provide deep dives into mechanics of content creation and how to bring your settings, um, anything that you can think of, uh, basically onto the table. Uh, but Chris, basically, who are we is probably the question everybody's asking. Um, and, uh, why are we doing this crazy thing in the first place? We're just like, you know, some dudes. <laughs> yeah. Y- yeah. You know. <laughs> um, but we're, 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 we're dudes who have a passion for gaming and for Genesis. So let me actually start by introducing you listeners to the illustrious GM Hooli. So Hooli got his start in the podcasting realm, actually on my other show, uh, mm. the order 66 podcast as a storied segment producer. Um, and soon after, he began the popular Dice Pool podcast dedicated to the Genesis RPG. He is an incredibly talented writer who also works as a freelancer for Fantasy Flight Games with several contributions already to his name, including the Legend of the Five Rings RPG. Mm. Uh, GM Hooley also brings over 35 years of gaming experience to this show, which I guess will come in handy, maybe. Yeah, yeah I seriously doubt it. But <laughs> yeah, yeah you're, you're probably right. <laughs> 
But uh, so, yeah, okay, so you've introduced me. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, but uh, le- now let me introduce you um, all to GM Chris. Now, Chris is best known as the host of the Order 66 podcast, uh, the original podcast devoted to Star Wars role playing, um, which has covered both uh, Wizards of the Coast, uh, Saga Edition, um, as well as the FFG Star Wars RPG. Um, his yes. podcast basically has uh, your experience is pretty much legendary, may I just say, uh, and goes back in excess of 10 years. Uh, did podcasts even exist back 10 years ago? Or were they see, a I'm thing? So, I'm so, <laughs> see, right now, every white guy over 30 uh, has a podcast. Um, I'm so hipster that I can be like, yeah, I was podcasting before it was cool. <laughs> Indeed. And uh, in addition to co-founding the D20 Radio Network, uh, which is the network that uh, we here belong to, um, and is serving as one of the directors of Gaming Nation Con. Uh, Chris has over 25 years of gaming experience and has created scores of adventures for the Star Wars RPG, all of which I've played and all of which I've killed a few players, characters. But anyway, moving on. Um, and several settings for the Genesis role-playing game, some of which that you will find right now on the Foundry. Yes, you will! (laughs) (laughs) It's so cool. (laughs) Excitement! Is that what the kids say? Hashtag excitement? Hashtag excitement? I don't know. Look, I'm older. Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) All right, so you pretty much know all there is to know about each of us now, Um, and if you don't, well, you can always send us a message. Uh, but, uh, Chris, I think we should probably get on this show on the road. What do you reckon? Yeah, I think we should spend a good 20 or 30 more minutes talking about us. Um, no, no, no. No, 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 let's not do <laughs> no, no, that. No, it would be bad. Let's not, we, we have a show. <laughs> Indeed. We have a show. Indeed. So let's get this episode of The Forge heated up with some exciting announcements and news in a segment we like to call Stoking the Fire. Stoking the Fire. And welcome to Stoking the Fire, a segment dedicated to letting you know all there is to know about the releases from Genesis Foundry and the Genesis role-playing game. But first, Chris, would you like to tell us about the D20 Radio Podcast of the Week? Absolutely. This episode, we are going to highlight the Guardians of the Wills podcast. Um, They are helmed by the crew of the Staggering Dragon. This show is actually a Star Wars-focused romp Mm. through all things in the Star Wars Legends expanded universe. The the books, the comics, the video games that for decades expanded the lore of Star Wars. But these guys are also major role players, and Mm. I'm absolutely thrilled. Their most recent episode is the first in an actual play series that is going to become a regular part of their show, Mm. and it is... Hooli, would you agree? It is brilliantly produced. Amazing. Um, I was completely jealous when uh, I um, got that uh, downloaded, it, it's just fantastic. I can't, uh, yeah, I'm lost for words. Yeah, it was, it was very impressive. They do, they do a fantastic job. So for Genesis fans who want to hear some excellent narrative dice action in play, it's a good thing. And mm. you guys can find Guardians of the Wills and more amazing podcasts of gaming and geekery goodness over <laughs> at www.d20radio.com. Indeed. Uh, yeah, as I said, the, their first, um, their actual play episode, Dustin, who's the GM um, and uh, the brains behind Stagger and Dragon, um, he tells an amazing story. Um, and I can't wait to listen to it. And I know that they've recorded a good chunk of it, but they'll be releasing it every so often. Um, but yeah, I was hooked just from the, the, the way that it was produced, the story, the characters. He's got some great plays in there. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'll be following that with great interest, to coin a phrase. <laughs> but anyway, all right. <laughs> all right, so now on to uh, other announcements. So I guess the, uh, the biggest news is that the Genesis Foundry has arrived. Um, announcing, oh. Oh, it's amazing, isn't it? Um, so announced yesterday at FFG's in-flight report is the Genesis Foundry, a repository of Genesis-compatible products Uh, developed by freelancers, both old and new, um, as well as people you've probably never heard of before, Um, and uh, (laughs) is basically the basis of this very podcast. It is. 
Um, there are also quite a few offerings that are immediately available in the Foundry, and some of which I know we're going to talk about with our special guest yeah. uh, in just a short while. Mm. Um, but these include, right now, available for the Genesis role-playing game, mm. uh, several adventures for Terranoth um, and Shadow of the Beanstalk Android. Mm -hmm. Um, a few new settings, um, including one that we will talk about later uh, in the show by uh, by special guest Keith Kappel, mm. uh, who's coming on. Um, other contributors of new settings, including D20 Radio's own uh, podcast host um, uh, uh, from, from Don't Despair, um, Scott Zumwalt. Mm. Um, there's also uh, additional source material for each of the existing FFG settings, um, with, with one I'm particularly looking forward to, uh, which is Kat Ostrander's take on Mars mm. for Shadow of the Beanstalk yeah. for Android. Yep. Um, absolutely love it. And there's several expansions to the Genesis Core rulebook, um, amazing contributors uh, such as Sterling Hershey, uh, mm -hmm. who we will also be having on the show yep. in co coming months. So we will be talking about the Foundry itself a lot more just a bit um if you if you've been living under a rock on mars and you haven't uh heard of it and you've somehow found this podcast which i don't know how that's possible but <laughs> we we will <clears throat> we'll be talking about it in great depth as we get to the core meat of this show absolutely. which we have a special segment named for that we'll get to we'll get to absolutely uh the other oh, thing is Oh look! The the other things that two big announcements that uh, that they've uh, they've handed out and mentioned, uh, which um, hopefully we'll we'll talk to Sam about, um, is uh, the Genesis GM screen, which is uh, which is absolutely <sighs> something that I've been dying for 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 forever. Uh, yeah, because, you know, I've been using Star Wars, but there are some key differences, and, and I hate book flipping at the table. So uh, having that screen there, um, yeah, it's just going to be helpful. If for, if for nothing else other than the critical hit table, which I'm hoping is on there. It normally is. So let's see. Because <laughs> we, we don't really know what's going to be on there. So, uh, so yeah, let's hope that, 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 that that's on there as well. But the other thing, which is really I'm excited about, um, is an expansion to the Genesis rules themselves uh, with the uh, with the players um, expansion, which gives a whole heap of additional things which are out there as well. Um, which uh, yeah, obviously we'll learn about more in the uh, in the coming months. But um, yeah, it's totally looking forward to that. Um, I was involved in the playtest of that, and yeah, everybody's going to be super excited. When they get it on the table, uh, so it's great. Uh, I, I can't, I can't <laughs> wait, and I'm, I'm thrilled that it's a generic uh, supplement too. It's not, yeah. you know, it's for the, it's for the generic core system, which we haven't had yet. Both, both, both products are so that's, yep. that's great. But guys, you all can learn more about these exciting announcements, uh, especially everything about the Foundry and what's on offer currently via the Fantasy Flight Games website at www.fantasyflightgames.com. So go check that out. Indeed. All right, so before we get into our focus of tonight's show, let's take a quick stroll through the rule book in a segment we like to call Die Casting. Die Casting. So the Forge podcast is all about bringing new creations to the table. And, and the Genesis RPG provides us all with a powerful set of tools to do so. Existing skills and talents. Mm. Now, the die casting segment is a, a regularly uh, recurring segment that we're going to have that is about closely examining individual skills and individual talents and how they relate to the creations that you craft for your table. Now, this episode, we are going to discuss the intricacies of the misunderstood, overused, and underused <laughs> combat skills yep. of melee and range. Oh, dear. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, but Chris, this segment typically focuses um, on uh, you know a single skill or a talent. So why are we basically going to be talking about ranged and melee? Why two? Yeah, yeah, easy, easy. Because the two are inextricably linked, um, yep. and their potential sub skills matter in relation to each other and how they are implemented in a custom setting. In other words, what you decide to do for one impacts the other. Yeah. Um, but you know, Huli, maybe maybe it's best to begin with an overview of the melee and range skill options. Mm. Indeed. So basically, the Genesis Core rulebook provides all of the details on melee, melee light, melee heavy, ranged, ranged light, and then ranged heavy. Now that's part found on page sixty-seven to sixty-nine of the Genesis Core rulebook. Uh, now both are going to be combat skills, or both are combat skills. Um, and uh, when they're used, um, you use them to make combat checks. 
uh, wielding melee or or ranged weapons, respectively. Okay, so what's the difference between the light and the heavy versions of each skill? Good question. So basically, the uh, the light and uh, heavy versions cover uh, basically just different types of weapons that are wielded normally. Um, it's one hand or two hands. So if they're light weapons, they're held in one hand. Um, and if they're a heavy version, uh, they're in two hands. So if you've got like a two-handed sword, it's probably going to be a heavy, um, heavy melee weapon. But if you've got a, a rapier, uh, where it's a, it's a much lighter blade, you'd be looking at something like a, a, a melee light. Okay, so light, one-handed weapons, yep. heavy, two-handed weapons. Typically, yes. Um, but uh, look, that's the best way to distinguish which weapons uh, the skill applies to. Okay. So the distinction between light and heavy makes total sense. But holy, mm. why, are, why are there also these general ranged and melee skills? What, what do they do? Okay. So basically, the, the general range skill covers all ranged weapons. Now, that's both one-handed and two-handed. And the, sh- the, the same basically goes for general melee skills as well. So, you know, uh, and it's going to be dependent on your setting. Okay, so w- when do I use the general skill and when do I use the light and heavy sub-skills? It depends on the setting. So a setting either needs to use ranged or ranged light and ranged heavy. Uh, same for melee. Uh, a setting will either have a general combat skill or two specific subskills. Uh, the Genesis rulebook highlights both the general and the specific skills because Genesis is designed to work in any setting. So, uh, so they've tried to cover all bases. Okay. So when do I use what with each setting? Okay. So the core rulebook actually gives some guidelines which are easily uh, consolidated on table... Um, table 131, I think it is, if I'm looking at it in front of me, um, on page 53. So, to put it simply, use melee, range light, and range heavy, unless it's a fantasy setting. You know, if it's a fantasy setting, use melee light, melee heavy, and then ranged. Easy enough. So, okay, so it, it seems that the, the melee ranged breakout is focused based on what you just said, on how yep. prevalent close quarters combat versus range combat occurs in your setting. Yep. Like, I mean, in other words, like in fantasy, most combat is melee combat. So you break out melee, the general skill, into mm-hmm. melee light and melee heavy with a generic range skill. Yep. But in steampunk, weird war, modern, sci-fi, space opera, range combat is what most likely is going to happen. So you then break that out into range light and range heavy while keeping a generic melee skill. Mm. But, okay, well then, Huli, why have generic skills at all? Why not just use melee light, melee heavy, range light, and ranged heavy in all settings? Well, look, it basically comes down to game balance. Um, uh. in, in, in personal scale combat, the, the primary skill checks will be made with handheld weaponry, just due to the nature of the setting itself. Um, so, you know, you break out the combat skills for handheld weaponry too much, then the players are forced to spend their XP across so many different skills that they won't necessarily be using all that much. So, you know, you uh, they're being forced to spread their XP a little bit too thin. Plus, it adds a needless complexity, in my opinion. Conversely, um, you typically don't want to make it too generic as uh, as far as combat skills go, or you end up with the PCs who are all excellent combatants in any scenario. Uh, so when they really shouldn't be, which which is basically why there's a general ranged and general melee um, skills without some form of sub skills. Bad idea. Yes, very bad Got idea. It. <laughs> So, so, so it's very much Goldilocks and the Three Bears here. The, the porridge can't be too hot. The porridge can't be too cold. Yeah. I mean, I mean, setting aside brawl, just melee and just range is far too simple and is going to make your players too powerful. But going whole hog with heavy and light versions of both skills is too complex. So you, you kind of need a, a half and half approach. Yeah. Typically, yes. 
Okay, okay. But which half, ranged or melee, is given subskills of light and heavy is based on my setting. Okay, so the subskills of light and heavy are going to be given to whichever skill is going to be used the least by your players in your setting. The exception to this rule, however, might be a setting like, say, Eberron mm. or Knight's Edge or really any sort of um, any sort of steampunk fantasy setting where both ranged and melee will be used equally. Um, the GM then needs to choose which direction they want to go. Uh, include both or choose one to be the general skill. You can run a campaign with both heavy and light in both ranged and melee. It's possible. This is something that you will have to discuss with your players um, at the start of the campaign. Or if you... Um, or you might just have to choose yourself if you're building your own setting for submission uh, to the Foundry. Okay. And the core rulebook goes so far as to break out what applies when by setting type. Yeah, indeed, yeah. Okay, okay. So, hooli my hooli, mm -hmm. what do I do if I have a setting that doesn't fall into any of those categories that are brought up in the core rulebook? Fair call. So then you need to seriously consider whether the PCs and the NPCs in the setting will predominantly fight with ranged weapons or with melee weapons. Whatever the dominant form of combat is, um, that needs to be specialised with the subskills of light and heavy for that form of combat. Uh, for a balanced game, you need to bring in that distinction in the dominant form of combat. When it comes to using common melee and ranged weapons in combat, the dichotomy of one general skill for one type of weapon and a light and heavy skill for the other type of weapon is well play-tested. Um, and uh, it's a tried-and-true method. Wicked. Okay, what about non-common weapons? What about barehanded combat? Combat with big freaking <laughs> cannons and, and space guns and psychic alchemy magic ghost powers, Willie. <laughs> what about that? Look, um, uh, let's face it, that's a subject for, uh, for another, uh, another matter altogether, another section, perhaps, perhaps in die casting, which we'll get into. Boo. <laughs> oh, come now. <laughs> but basically we have to we do have to move on but i do have to mention that melee combat and range combat are not the only ones that this can apply to we'll talk about this in another segment at a later stage however it depends on the type of setting that you're running if you're running something which is all about courtroom dramas and things like that you may find that some of your social skills, even though that social skills are broken down into five different types in Genesis, you may find that you might need to make those specialised. Perhaps negotiation needs um, two additional um, subsets to them, but it's going to be dependent on your setting. So, yeah. But anyway, it's time to move on. So, now that the fires are nice and hot, and we're, I think we've got everybody uh, itching to hear from uh, our special guests. Um, it's time to enter... The Furnace? The Furnace. The Furnace. And welcome to The Furnace, the segment where we take a deep dive into a topic concerning custom creations using the Genesis role-playing game. Now, as we are smithing our very first episode tonight, we thought it best to bring in a master craftsman to show us the ropes. To that end, we're proud to welcome a special guest like no other. Lead developer on the Genesis RPG, RPG manager at Fantasy Flight Games, and good friend of the podcast, let us introduce you to the man, the myth, the legend, Sam Gregor Stewart. Welcome to the show, Sam. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks a lot for having me on. It's, it's a real um, honor for me. It's an absolute pleasure, as always. Absolutely. We're, we're thrilled to have you with us, Sam. Thank you so much. For taking the time now for those listeners who've listened to the order 66 podcast and the dice pool podcast over the years um they're probably quite familiar with you <laughs> um <laughs> but uh, for those new listeners who may have found the forge all on their own uh perhaps we could take a few moments for a little bit of an intro on you 
Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, as you pointed out, I'm the uh, manager for Fantasy Flight Games role playing department, um, and uh, I've had the absolute pleasure and privilege of being the one of the lead developers on Genesis and um, its expansions. Um, and I've also had a chance to work on many of our other game lines over the years. Um, I've been with uh, Fantasy Flight for over a decade now um, and worked on everything from the old uh, Warhammer 40k role-playing games mm-hmm. to Star Wars to now this and Legend of the Five Rings. So been doing a lot of rpg design and development over the years very cool. so okay has gaming always been a passion for you how did you get into gaming in the first place <laughs> yeah um actually it's kind of funny because uh um, i didn't really get into role-playing games or any kind of gaming until uh i went to college and before i got into tabletop rpgs i actually played computer rpgs specifically uh, neverwinter nights um the bioware uh, classic <laughs> right yes and after my freshman and sophomore year playing that um i met some good friends who actually had a uh, steady game and they offered me a chance to actually experience what it what, what the uh what the original role playing game was like, and uh, so I tried out D and D. I think it was three point just shifting over to three point five at that point, and that was my first role playing experience. Um, I uh, also got into uh, miniatures games at about the same time, so that's a, a parallel hobby and sometimes a uh, intersecting one when you use miniatures for your role playing games. Very true. See so. This is very true. Some people call miniatures a hobby. Others call it a um, a, a second mortgage. But that's, um... <laughs> Isn't that true? Don't <laughs> don't tell my wife that uh, you said that. <laughs> <laughs> as I uh, as I look around my uh, my office and the stacks and stacks of unpainted models. Uh. Oh wow! So okay, you you you've been obviously working for RPGs as you said for a very long time, doing a lot of design, a lot of play. So. Obviously, this podcast is focused on Genesis, and we absolutely adore this system. And we we've been in love with the narrative dice system since you know uh, you know FFG first acquired the Star Wars license. Mm. Um, you know, and Genesis gives us this unique opportunity to apply that amazing narrative dice system to any concept we want. So I have to ask you, when it comes to concepts, settings. Uh, types of games, themes. What is your first love of Genesis? What do you really love to get on the table when you play? <laughs> That's honestly an incredibly hard question for me to answer <laughs> because it sounds like a cop out, and I don't mean it that way. <laughs> I have enjoyed playing so many different things in Genesis. Mm-hmm. Um, I've um, gotten to play Terranoth um, themed games, uh, Android themed games, um, science fiction, um, Age of Myth, uh, um, urban fantasy, and some particularly um, some even stranger ones um, that uh, have been hosted by. Uh, well, there's uh, there's one particular one I remember uh, this last year that you hosted, Chris. That was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one of the more unique role playing experiences <laughs> I've ever had. Um, and all of them have been incredibly enjoyable. And that's one of the things that, uh, that I like about the system. I, if I had to pick a first love, I think it's one that I don't actually dabble in very often, but I find really interesting. And that's uh, urban fantasy um, combines the uh, Genesis magic system with not requiring a lot of, a lot of like setting development you can just sort of apply your own uh, community to it and mm-hmm. go as deep or shallow as you uh, want to yeah. there's something real there's something really interesting about it i'm also a huge dresden files fan so uh, uh, well yes, that yes. explains it then <laughs> definitely definitely very good all right, so Excellent. so Sam, basically, as as the RPG manager for Fantasy Flight Games, and since you were also the lead designer on on Genesis itself, can you tell us about the creation of the Genesis system and and what basically the goals are, how it came about? Because um, obviously, it's come from Star Wars initially, 
and then it's sort of it's been developed into Genesis. So how did that all happen in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Genesis. Um, or um, the concept of the narrative dice system has existed in several forms and most recognizable in the uh, st- form of Star Wars, um, mm-hmm. starting with Edge of the Empire back in 2012. Mm-hmm. Um, all the way back in 2012. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, It doesn't seem that long um, ago, does it? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Um, Seven years. Oh, God. (laughs) We were all so much younger then. Um, (laughs) But uh, it was originally designed um, by Jay Little, um, Mm -hmm. who also uh, designed uh, the um, the game X-Wing, which I'm sure is something a lot of your listeners have heard of. Um, And he designed the core system for Genesis and the... uh, what we've now come to call the narrative dice system, the mm. basis, the engine of both Star Wars role playing and Genesis role playing. Yep. Um, and the original, the original goal was to create a role playing experience that was very different. That was, um, had more narrative focus, but still had some crunch to it till still had some meat to it. It was mm. sort of straddling the line between a really narrative storytelling game and a more mechanics-heavy traditional role-playing game. Yep. It, we also were trying to do something that had absolutely not been done before with Star Wars specifically, which was a uh, tall order because there were two very, very popular uh, um, versions of Star Wars. And I'm being very general there. I realize there was actually one, two, three, four. <laughs> four Chris, you could probably count it better than I could since you <laughs> covered you, most you, of them on your podcast. You, yeah, yeah. <laughs> If you include West End Games original D6 version, um, they had two versions of that technically, and then technically Wizards of the Coast published three versions. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah, because their first D20, their second D20, and their uh, Saga edition. Yep. Saga edition. Yep. Mm. yep. Yep. So, but there were two general concepts: the version using D6s, the version using D20s, and yes. so we had to do something very different than both of those. Mm. So. That's where sort of Genesis's um, beginnings came about, the narrative dice system's beginning. For Genesis itself, um, that was something that came about uh, a few years ago. I want to say 2016 was when we started working on it. And it was because, um, I actually can remember it. It was, we had gone, um, I had gone to visit um, the convention that the Order 66 podcast puts on in uh, Dallas, Gamer Nation, mm-hmm. um, played in a game where um, uh, one of the Order 66, Order 66's co-hosts, uh, Phil Miuski, had uh, um, done a hack of Genesis in a different um, setting, or mm-hmm. a hack of Star Wars at that point. Yep. Um, and then... Uh, you and I, uh, Chris, went out to uh, afterwards, and uh, we were. Um, I think we were driving around before uh, you dropped me off at the airport, and we're talking about uh, as we got older and uh, we're playing. Oh God, I uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, yes. I remember um, this conversation. The older we get, the less time yeah. we have to focus on different <laughs> systems. Exactly, and the more we just want to take uh, take one idea that we know really well and do different things with it, and that stuck with me. A few months uh, later, I pitched the idea of t- creating a narrative, uh, sorry, narrative, a generic version of Star Wars that we could sell. And um, at the time, uh, we didn't even have a name for it. We were just going to call it the narrative dice system. Hmm. Um, thank goodness uh, my boss, uh, Andrew, had a uh, better branding idea than that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, and a year later, we had finished the uh, core book and uh, we're getting it uh, sent out. Very good. And I'll tell you what, just after hearing that story, can I say that there are a lot of conversations that go on in Chris's car when uh, we're coming to the airport, let me tell you. Because <laughs> there are some, I yes, <laughs> like um, me getting into podcasting um, was part of a conversation in the car on the way to the airport. So there you go. So anyway, <laughs> it's... Um... I I can only imagine that makes so much sense. <laughs> <laughs> to be on a fly so on the wall. Saying, what, you, 
what you're saying is my car is a magical place? It is. It is. Yeah. Apparently. Uh, but anyway. Apparently. So I can never get rid of that car. Okay. <laughs> yes. um, also, uh, Dallas has a lot of really long stretches of highway. So... <laughs> You spend a lot of time in a car. Yes, that is true. true. Well, well, Dallas is not a magical place, so I'm just going to chalk it up to the car. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's fair. (laughs) Very good. Now, for people who've never actually played Genesis or, you know, they've um, uh, discovered this podcast by picking up the book and not really knowing much about it, can you tell us what players and GMs get out of Genesis that perhaps they won't find in other RPGs? Or, or what's sort of the difference between it and, and others? Absolutely. Um, the core difference of Genesis um, to most other role-playing games is the, uh, is the concept of um, not only is there success and failure, but there is also something we call advantage and threat. Mm-hmm. And a good way to think of it is um, if you think of average or if you think of a lot of role playing games as having sort of a binary um, access of six of um, results mm-hmm. there, you're either going to succeed or you're going to fail when you make a check to see what happens in your game. Mm-hmm. And maybe you'll succeed more. Maybe you'll fail more, but it's still going along one line. What we do is basically add a second line that is independent of that first, and that's threat and advantage. Mm -hmm. And you can think of those as sort of other good or bad things that happen when you make the check, but you don't have to get one to get the other. Mm -hmm. So you can get success but still generate threat, which can uh, mean that you may succeed but there's a complication. Or you can fail, but in failing you may get advantage and that means that even though you failed, something good may have come across as well. Mm. And you can also succeed with advantage and you can fail with threat. Um, so you can have really good results or you can have absolutely terrible results. <laughs> and these are all, um, these are, since these are all axes, accesses, they, they can be, you can have, you have gr- more, greater magnitude of success, greater magnitude of advantage, greater magnitude of threat. Mm. So it basically just creates a lot more possible results off of any one check. Mm. And the players and the GM then get the opportunity to take those results and narrate how that affects their game. Mm. And it can be everything from something very small, such as you gain a small benefit on your next check or a, your somebody gains a small benefit um, on a check targeting you, perhaps um, something very mechanical like that, or something incredibly um, story changing. Um, maybe you're, uh, um, you're fighting in a darkened room and you're fighting somebody with like night vision goggles. Mm-hmm. You, uh, take a swing at them and you miss, but you roll a ton of advantage. You might not only might you hit the, uh, bl- the, wi- the sealed windows and blow them open. But at that point, the sun is shining, shining so brightly that it dazzles the person wearing the night vision goggles mm. and, um, uh, they suddenly can't see it all. And they're just blinded. Mm. Like it can be as, you know, that completely changes what's going on in the game. And so it's, so it's Clarice from Silence of the Lambs, basically. <laughs> That's it, exactly. It, yeah. It, it, it puts the lotion on its skin. <laughs> yes. Oh, dear. <laughs> it- you you could say that. <laughs> so that's the that's the heart of what um, makes uh, Genesis special. Yeah. Um, Cool. Yeah. Now, as opposed to, to Star Wars, which is very sort of um, rigid as far as that that's the world that you're dealing with, um, could you talk to us a little bit about the the custom creation rules that that Genesis provides? So, so obviously for um, for people who are wanting to go out and buy the book of Genesis, um, that that sounded very religious just then. Um, so if you wanted to, to, to go and buy Genesis. Hooli, hooli, it was religious. 
very true. Um, <laughs> so if, if – um, now, what was I saying? Now, as far as that, just tell us a little bit about the, the custom creation rules of Genesis, I guess, and, and because Genesis is very much a, uh, a template for creating settings. Because obviously you've got other books like Terranoth and uh, Shadows of the Beanstalk. Shadow of the Beanstalk. I get that wrong all the time. Um, There's only one. There's only one sun, so there can only be one shadow. <laughs> right. Very good. I should remember that. Um, so yeah, tell us a little bit about the custom creation rules. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so you have, you have a very good point there. Um, with Star Wars, we were playing in. We are playing in someone else's sandbox, yep. and. Lucasfilm is very generous in letting us do so, and we absolutely enjoy it. Mm. And but as part of the responsibility of being able to work with somebody else's intellectual property and um, story is that you must remain true to that story. Mm. Um, Genesis, because Genesis at its core is a generic system, it is not designed with any particular setting in mind. Mm. Um, and one of the things that that's all, that allows us is to um, basically provide a look under the hood and for us to actually start discussing with uh, the readers hmm. what makes the engine run. So with Genesis, we strive for a tone that's more... Uh, more engaging and informal. We, we, the developers, are talking to you, the uh, readers and the players, and we're explaining, here's why we do the things we do, here's how we do the things we do, mm -hmm. and our reasoning behind it. So the custom creation rules you mentioned um, for creating mechanical elements such as the archetypes or species that characters are based off of, careers, uh, items, talents, skills... Um, and all of that, uh, those are, we, we created those with the, with the knowledge that people would want to take Genesis and make their own setting and therefore their own game with it. And that meant they were going to need the tools to make their own rules hmm. to accommodate their game because not every rules um, set of rules is going to be appropriate for every setting. Mm -hmm. You don't have magic in a science fiction setting, unless it's a very specific kind of, kind of science fiction setting. <laughs> and uh, you have uh, spaceships in your um, heroic fantasy setting. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, basically a big chunk of Genesis, um, the core book goes into how to design your own game, ele game elements to better fit your own particular game and your own particular setting. Yep, absolutely. Um, so can you tell our listeners, and I know I just mentioned it before, um, <laughs> but can you tell our listeners just a, a little bit about what already exists for the Genesis uh, role-playing game line? Because obviously we've got the core rulebook, um, which uh -huh. is the, the framework, as I mentioned. Um, and uh, then we've got two other setting books. Can you just sort of briefly explain both of those? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, as you pointed out, the core book is the is the main book you need for the game, and it's the book that all Genesis players should pick up, should expect to pick up. Um, there are also um, dice packs with the narrative dice. Mm -hmm. um, they have the same dice distribution as our Star Wars role-playing dice, but uh, different symbols. Mm -hmm. However, it's not too hard to interpret between the two of them if you're a longtime Star Wars role-playing player. Yep. Uh, so um, you can pick up a dice pack or two. We also provide a app that uh, you can use to roll the dice on your phone. Mm. Um, all, and once you have those, as you mentioned, we currently have two setting source books. Mm. Um, the idea being... We take the framework of rules that is created in the core book, and then we say, and here's how to play Genesis in a particular kind of setting, or mm -hmm. actually, in this case, in a very particular setting. Yep. And we have started with two of our popular perennial settings. Um, one is Terranoth, which is the setting of our Descent Board game, our Rune Wars miniatures game, and old Rune Wars board game, Rune Bound the board game, there's a bit of a rune theme throughout a lot of Terranoth <laughs> products. But, uh, yes, the, the book Realms of Terranoth is essentially 
um, a very traditional heroic fantasy genre. Um, mighty heroes bat- bat- battling dastardly villains, swords, um, sorcery, um, elves, dwarves, orcs, dragons, all, all of that good stuff. Um, and um, this, that book provides all of the rules you need to make, a, uh, to make characters and run a campaign in Terranoth. You can also take all of those rules and run it in just about any heroic fantasy setting mm-hmm. uh, with some, some minor tweaks and adjustments. Yep. Um, and also a whole bunch of background information and a whole bunch of adversaries. So if you want to run a Terranoth game, you can pretty much get by with just that book and Genesis, and it all should set things pretty well. Mm. Shadows of the Beanstalk, the other one you mentioned, is a very similar book, except it's for our Android setting. Um, Android is, uh, the setting, um, that was originally created for the board game by the same name created by Kevin Wilson, and Dan Clark. And since then we've done board game, New Angeles, the card game, Android Netrunner, and a few other board games set in that universe. It's a hard science fiction, um, setting with uh, more than a hint of cyberpunk, mm. um, the future, the Earth is uh, the Earth is finally explore getting into space, and all of that is set um, set around one huge city on the equator called New Angeles, and the space elevator that rises up out of the center of it, which mm. is the proverbial beanstalk. Mm. An absolutely fantastic book, both of them. Uh, the uh, in typical FFG fashion. The artwork is just spectacular in all of those books. Um, and, uh, yeah, if, if you are into either of those two settings, uh, or even if it's just a fantasy or you've liked that whole cyberpunk and, you know, we look at cyberpunk 20, 20, is it 2020? Is that what they're still calling it for um, the computer I, game or 2049? I believe or? it is cyberpunk 2020, which okay. means uh, they've only got a year to wait. <laughs> I still haven't got my flying cars. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, both if you're like that sort of, those sort of settings, perfect books. Um, and because of, of how well Genesis can be merged with the likes of also, if, if people have gone out and bought Star Wars, that they can certainly import some of the things that, uh, that are in those products uh, and just, you know, reskin them as as. You know, I've certainly done myself. <laughs> I don't think you're the only one. No, I'm pretty much okay, sure. S- <laughs> speaking, s- speaking of speaking of cyberpunk and speaking of, of 2020 coming up, um, we do have to say, and this is on a sad note, we didn't talk about this. It was last week, I think on the I think the 25th or 24th of July, right? Um, that uh, Rudger Hauer um, yes. passed away. Yes. Um, the exact same year that his famous character in Blade Runner, Roy Batty, passed away in the film. Weird. <laughs> That's Just a, more than a little, more than a little creepy. Mm. It is, and it's uh, definitely a loss. Yeah, definitely. Blade Runner is a probably one of my favorite films of all time. Um, and it's not just because mm-hmm. I'm a huge Harrison Ford fan, but just it was a piece of art that film and it hasn't aged all that badly either just very quietly it's oh. um it's great love that noir damn sort good of sequel for it too yes yes absolutely <laughs> all right so look it was only a few hours ago i know but um we've uh, uh there's been a few announcements with regards to uh, to genesis which is very very exciting so what might we expect coming soon sam with regards to uh, coming out, what's coming out for Genesis? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, and I'm really happy to announce that there are new products coming out, um, and that we now products we can talk about. Uh, we're really pleased. We're not just la- um, launching the program that we're going to be discussing later, um, yep. but uh, we're also going to be releasing um, two new products uh, in the next few months. One is a return back to the generic side of the um, Genesis um, generic system. Um, And that's an expanded player guide for Genesis. So um, this book um, is a 
supplement source book for Genesis in general. It's not tied to any specific setting. And in many ways, you can think of it as an expansion on the core book. Mm. It's another uh, hundred odd pages of of material for both game masters and players. And I'm yeah, I'm super excited about this because we were able to take we were able to take a lot of the feedback and what we saw people looking for once the Genesis core came out and we were able to put it into this book. So it has um, new example settings, um, some pretty cool ones and uh, it's going to have some new player content. Um, We could really go deeper into vehicles in this one, for example, from Mm -hmm. the few pages of rules we have. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's uh, it's got some interesting stuff in there and yes, some rule, um, some, much more in-depth rules on how to make your own vehicles. Yep. Um, it's going to have a uh, um, m- more information on adversaries, how to create them, uh, a challenge rating system for adversaries, Ooh. a way to measure their strengths in social combat and general encounters. Nice. Um, that we're very excited about. Yeah. Um, and a way to create your adversaries that will have a challenge rating when you're finished with them. Um, then there's a, then there's some other fun things as well. Um, we'll be really, we'll be revealing more as, uh, as the month, as the uh, weeks go on and everything, but, yep. um, some new player content for, uh, people who are interested in the magic system for Genesis, for example, yep. uh, some stuff we're really excited about. Um, some new optional rules, um, a couple new tones for people who like the uh, applying tones such as horror or... Uh, Superheroes. Or, uh, yeah, <laughs> horror, <laughs> noir, that kind of stuff. Yep. Actually, yep. sorry, I just uh, told you what one of the tones is. <gasps> oh, Because noir isn't in the core book. <gasps> yes, mm. noir is one of the ones. There you yeah. go, there's an exclusive on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Very good. When I yes. yeah, when you, when that was announced, I've just gone a little bit giddy. Um, so it was uh, yeah. I mean, look, I'll, I'll be honest and say I was involved in the playtest side of things, and it is brilliant. So well, I really look forward to to letting everybody else get to get that on their hands. That's yeah, it's amazing, absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah, we're super excited, and we are glad to have you as a part of it. Thanks. Um, so the other product is uh, something a little simpler, but uh, we're in many ways just as excited about it. And that is a, a Game Master screen for Genesis. Uh, yes. Fine. Yes. <laughs> so for the longest time, um, we wrestled with how we were going to create a GM screen for a system that didn't have a setting tied to it. Would we do a screen for every setting we released a book for? Would we just not do a screen perhaps? Um, and screens, you know, they're, some people love them. Some people hate them. Some people, uh, like sometimes myself keep, um, keep them at hand, but keep them flipped down so they can just reference the charts. Yep, yep. <laughs> but, uh, yep. we know there, we, yep, we know there are people who use them and people who get a lot of use out of them. Yep. So, this is a generic screen. It's for all of Genesis. And um, there's, you know, it, it does what it says on the tin, but uh, <laughs> there is a fantastic piece of art by Anders Feiner um, on it that uh, really, it turned out amazing. And um, yeah, I think, uh, I think that the, use, the usefulness of the screen is certainly important. It has all the charts on the back that... Uh, you need to quick reference to run the run Genesis, but that art, oh, I, I might start rolling my dice behind the screen just so I can use that. <laughs> Very good. It, well, you realize if, you, if you've got it up, Sam, you don't get to see the art. The players get to, you know. Yeah, but th- I, that's just that's just who I am. I'm just a giver. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. Maybe I should turn this. I should make them use the screen. <laughs> Every player has to have their own screen. <laughs> just so you can see the art. Yeah. You got five sets of it staring you back. <laughs> um, well, it's not as though you don't know the rules, Sam. So, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. There's no excuse. There's no yeah, excuse. Right. 
<laughs> yeah, that'll be that's the real benefit. There is no um, player who can be like, well, I don't know what the uh, what the crit result does. <laughs> oh, you sure do. It's right in front of you. <laughs> so, okay, we, we this is awesome. And obviously, yesterday we had these 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 new products announced at the In Flight Report at Gen Con. But we had another thing announced yesterday <laughs> at the in-flight report, which is obviously essential and critical to the focus of this particular podcast. Um, and, dude, if, and if you look at Twitter, people are flipping out. Um, we, if you're willing, would really like to dive into the Foundry. Yes, and I am certainly happy to talk about the Foundry. Very good. Okay, so... What is the Foundry, and where on earth did this crazy idea come from? <laughs> All right. So the Foundry um, is an online marketplace for players and any um, amateur designer and developer to create their own Genesis material and sell it to other people. Um, it is... Uh, a partnership with uh, one bookshelf. Um, they do drive through RPG. Uh, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it is a, you set up an account there, you host the material you've created for Genesis. Um, you sell it or distribute it to other players. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they pay for it. They download it. I mean, a lot of your listeners are probably familiar with uh, how uh, drive through RPG works and mm-hmm. that you can buy PDFs of, uh, of most role-playing games there, this is no different. You can buy PDFs of content created for Genesis by, honestly, a lot of people just like you. Mm. And uh, I will point out um, that uh, some of that content is created by you two, in fact. Mm. Indeed. (laughs) Indeed. Well, we'll go into that at a later stage. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. But this is um, that is the uh, that is the foundry in a nutshell. The idea came from uh, I've got to give a lot of credit to um, two people, uh, Katrina Ostrander and Simone Elliott. Um, Katrina um, was a our uh, fiction editor, story manager, and um, worked in the RPG department of Fantasy Flight Games um, and. Uh, I say was only because she's gone on to a much higher paying job <laughs> in the last year. Yep. But, uh, um, but you know, that's the, uh, fortune that, that what, that's what happens in the game industry. Sometimes, um, she still works with us on our fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Simone Elliott is our head of licensing. And, um, this was, uh, something that they came up with and, um, it took a while to get off the ground, but, um, at, eventually it became very much a team effort that we worked with um with uh one bookshelf um the parent company behind drive through and mm-hmm. they're very uh very fantastic very cooperative individuals they've certainly done this before mm-hmm. and so uh they were able to help us figure out how we were going to do it um my boss uh andrew navarro is a big uh a big push behind it as well and um Head of Asthma in North America, Steve Horvath. I mean, yeah, really. And I'm sorry, I sh- um, the person who put a lot of the heavy lifting into this um, is Tim Huckleberry. Mm. Um, he has been the point man for uh, getting this thing off the ground. Yeah. Um, so it is very much a group effort, but all of these people put a ton of effort into uh, making this thing happen. Mm. And I'm super proud with how it how it's turned out. Mm. And I believe that um, Kat Ostrander is also putting in. Um, she also has a product that's that's available as well. She, so she does. She does. So like, <laughs> is she is just a machine? Can I just say when it comes to <laughs> to pumping out content? And she because I know that she's obviously busy at what she does in in the work life, but to also do that and yeah, she we have to get Kat on the show at some point. Cato Strander is a maven. Uh, we order sixty six listeners will remember we we've had her on as a special guest more than once, yes. and uh, <clears throat> she was actually our guest of honor at Gamer Nation Con um, a few years back, Indeed. and uh, ran some of the most memorable sessions and panels that uh, I've been a party to. Yep. So yeah, she's yeah. she's amazing. She is. 
Absolutely. But yeah, yeah, we'll have to get her on the show at some at some stage, definitely. You absolutely should. Yes. All right. So now you you've mentioned obviously us and we've talked about can who can uh who's got product coming out, but is it only sort of uh, people who've been in the freelance realm or who can submit or who can submit to the foundry? Yeah, um, the shorter answer is anyone can submit um, to the foundry. Um, it is a completely open marketplace to anyone who's got a, a cool idea and uh, um, the uh, chops to lay something out and uh, um, design something and put it up for uh, sale or distribution. Hmm. So. Uh, each and every one of your listens or listens or listens or <clears throat> each and every one of your listeners could, uh, um, take a stab at it. Perfect. That's great. Listeners. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to do that again? <laughs> but from, for, for, for forever and from now, Sam, they will be referred to as, uh, Lit list listeners. <laughs> listeners. <laughs> Listen, listeners. They will be the listeners. listeners. <laughs> Yes, we, the Forge doesn't have listeners. We have listen, list, listeners. <laughs> list, listeners. Um, for, na- for now and for now. So, you okay. heard it here first. I, you heard it first. So, so these listeners that are uh, interested in actually you know, doing the submission, if they're able to, I mean, what are, what are the guidelines for submitting? And, I mean, are there any limitations to what people can and can't submit? Yeah, absolutely. There, there are certainly guidelines, and there are limitations. Um, a lot of the information I'm going to share can also be found on the Foundry's website, so mm-hmm. you don't you uh, you can double check things. But uh, I'm certainly happy to go over uh, some of the basics, and um, it can be summed up. The limitations can be summarized fairly fairly concretely in: you can't submit anything that completely. Uh, reprints our rules Mm -hmm. so you can't uh you can't submit a big chunk of our core rule book and try and sell it for example um basically people should need to use the genesis core rule book to play whatever game they all they play with your stuff Mm. um and uh so that's one part of it another part is that you can't submit something that belongs to somebody else that should go without saying, but <laughs> so so my Harry my Harry Potter homebrew off the table. <laughs> I'm afraid so. Uh, that is uh, that is not something you can sell. So if it's un- if it's a setting that's under copyright from someone else, uh, you can't sell it. If it's got um, other elements that are under copyright from somebody else, you can't uh, sell it. Uh, and you can't distribute it on the foundry either, even if you're doing it for no cost. Mm. It just can't, cannot be on the foundry. Mm. Um, and uh, there are, of course, agreements you have to um, click on when you submit your stuff. And people who break the rules, their stuff will be pulled and potentially their accounts could be banned. I mean, mm. this is a um, this is professional mm. in a uh in a sense. And so because of that, um, there are, um, everyone has to abide by the laws of the land. Yep. Um, there's a few other, uh, a few other things to consider. Um, we, we require certain legalese to be, uh, posted on our, um, on any of your materials that basically acknowledges what this is for. Mm-hmm. Um, and so forth. Um, there are some limitations on, I mentioned art, for example. So you can, uh, you know, you can't go onto somebody else's, uh, deviant art page and just take their art and put it in your book mm. unless you have their permission yep. and you can prove that you have their permission. Um, uh, you know, some people say by all means use our stuff and then you can, but, uh, Otherwise, uh, you know, you have to be careful about this stuff. And we don't mm. want people to make money off of other people's work yep. when they don't get credited. Mm. And that's the most important thing. So we have some guidelines on uh, art that you can use. We also actually provide some art um, from our settings that you can use as well. That you can, there's free to download or you can put into your material. Mm-hmm. Um, finally, um, there are, well, two final things. There's a... 
Um, there's a logo that we require you to put on the material. Um, the Genesis Foundry logo um, signifies it's part of the program. And um, if you're messing around in our settings, that's okay, but we have a few limitations there. You can uh, make something set in the Android setting, or you can make something set in the Terranoff setting. However, um, some of our other internal IPs, such as Arkham Horror or um, Twilight Imperium, Sovereigns of Steam, um, things like or Tannhauser, those are off limits, um, mm. at least at least for now. <laughs> and uh, we always reserve the right to go back and change that in the future. But for yep. now, you have to stay out of them, I'm afraid. Right. Um, so that's the, those are some of the big guidelines. And one other thing I should mention, though, that isn't a limitation, and it's really important to note, is that if you put something on the foundry that is your own setting, um, you've come up with your own cool creative idea, you know, it's... Uh, it's uh, a new space pirate fantasy setting or something. Um, we own the mechanics because it's Genesis, mm. but you own that IP. Yeah. We don't own that IP. So you, um, you don't get to sell like a Genesis version of that um, rule set anywhere else. But if you want to take space pirate fantasy and do a novel about it later or uh themed mug about it or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> that you know, the setting itself is yours to do with what you want. Very cool. I'm already envisioning the themed mugs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you can, uh, if you can manage to make a go of it. <laughs> Indeed. Very, very good. All right. So what sort of, uh, you mentioned uh, briefly there that there is artwork that's available. What, what other resources are available to, to help people create their own work? Yeah. Um, we provide a, a few elements for people to get started. And um, potentially as this project program goes on, um, other people will provide other elements through the, um, through the foundry. Hmm for their fellow developers to and um, designers to use. Mm -hmm. But for now, um, I mentioned some art packs that you can download of Android art, Terranoth art, um, general fantasy art, and general science fiction art. So you can use those in your, um, your products. Uh, also, um, we have template packages for you to use. Um, these are in InDesign and PDF and basically if you, um, InDesign for those of you who don't know is a desktop publishing program. Um, it's through Adobe mm -hmm. and, uh, um, but yeah, and then PDF is for people who don't have access to InDesign because it is a very high end expensive program <laughs> and yes, we know not <laughs> everyone uh, has the money to shell out on that stuff. Yeah. But, uh, you can use these templates. They come with um, backgrounds, fonts, um, paragraphs, and instructions on how to do basic layout to basically create a uh, PDF that looks like it was looks like a book, looks like mm. something we might make. Um, mm. And yeah, those are all free to download and free for you to use to uh, to create products. Yes, anybody who knows how to use InDesign in our uh, in our industry has just become very very popular. Uh, there is no two ways about that. I am yeah I I know very little about InDesign, but um, yeah Scott Samwalt, who um, is also part of the uh, runs the podcast as part of the network called um, Don't yep. Despair. Don't, don't don't despair. Yeah, yep. yep. um, he's uh, he's very knowledgeable um, when it comes to uh, InDesign. So um, yeah, tap him on the shoulder. He's uh, definitely worth um, looking up. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah Scott. Scott but. is a Scott is a stone cold player when it comes to InDesign. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Yeah, the license is uh, um, knowing how to use it is half the battle, and paying for the uh, license is the other half. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so. Are there any sort of um, costs involved to submit your uh, your product uh, that you create uh, onto the um, onto the foundry? Yeah, that is a very good question, and the answer is there are no costs involved in submitting. Mm -hmm. And 
this is because this is an online marketplace, it is actually up to you as to how much, if anything, you want to charge for your product. Mm. Um, we offer some guidelines, and in fact, uh, Drive Through RPG um, offers some really great guidelines that uh, I heartily recommend anyone who wants to get into this um, check out. Um, t- it's some breakdowns on prices that are very successful, depending on what your product is. Um, all super interesting stuff. Heck, it was super interesting for me, and I've been in the industry for as a decade. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I definitely encourage people to check it out. Um, but um, as far as uh, prices go, you'll set the price, and, um, and then you will... Um, Whenever you sell a copy of it, whatever the price is, let's say you sell set something for ten dollars, you get fifty percent of that as royalties. Mm-hmm. Um, the other fifty percent goes to uh, is split between Drive Through RPG and Fantasy Flight. Um, there are some costs with maintaining the site and so forth. Yeah. Of course, um, we also discuss this. Um, on the uh, on the website as well for exact um, details, um, the money gets with um, you can withdraw the money via PayPal, um, and there is a small I believe it's like two dollar fee to withdraw the money, and uh, there's a waiting period before you can get the money. It doesn't just mm. happen immediately, but that should be about it for it. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, there's a waiting. They um, there's a waiting um, period that uh, drive through requires before you can get your money, but that's mostly to avoid fraud. Yeah. So yeah, yeah uh, basically that's about it. You um, basically just pro- a processing fee for the money transfer itself, and then royalties. Uh, there's also some information about uh, how taxes work and that sort of thing. Um, the long and the short of it is, yeah. Actually, I encourage people to. Uh, for all of that specific stuff to actually go on the site and yeah. read up on it. Uh, <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> there's a lot of info. <laughs> well, the Forge podcast said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine yeah. that coming up in an audit? No. Um, <laughs> yeah, let me offer... I Yeah, I will actually offer a serious disclaimer. Um, don't take any... Um, when it comes to very sp- the specific stuff on money and uh, taxes and processing fees and so forth... Please go by what we have on our website and yep. what uh, drive through um, pr- the information drive through provides as gospel. I'm not trying to trick anyone or lie to anyone, but yep. uh, go with the go with the printed word. Please. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and look, as because we're certainly not lawyers or or accountants or whatever else, but you know, if it is important yeah. to you to be totally informed about what uh, you want to do, always seek some legal advice. Or always go and speak to your accountant. That's uh, yeah, because we can we can rabbit on lo- as much as we want uh, here on the podcast. But um, yeah, we're not lawyers, um, so yeah, yeah. And, we're, and we're 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 not going to do that. No, no, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> and well, because and because I work for a uh, I work for a company. Other people actually handle the legal and accounting sides of things. Yeah. So I am first and foremost a uh, game designer and manager. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, okay, then as a game designer and manager, let's talk about something yeah. else then related to the foundry. What advice would you give to people who want to submit their work? Are there any big do's and don'ts when you're submitting? Yeah. Um, let's see. We've talked about some of the things some of the things you legally shouldn't do um, that would violate our terms of use or get your stuff pulled. Um, but uh, when it comes to what is successful and what is not successful, um, I mean, that's a whole other question. I mean, so one thing I would would definitely suggest to people is uh, take your time, see what see what people are really interested in, what people are really talking about. Um, don't be afraid to take some time to develop whatever it is you want to release. Um, and, uh, before you throw it up there, um, this isn't going anywhere. So, uh, you know, make sure you put your best foot forward. Mm. Um, I think check out some of the stuff that's already gone up as well. Um, and 
see what uh, see what other things are being offered. Um, I think uh, I talked about that uh, pricing um, and payment stuff. Like for a lot of people who haven't been in uh, been selling their stuff professionally before, and I'm guessing that applies to a lot of your listeners, mm. um, trying to figure out what to charge for your uh, creation can be a really tricky proposition. Mm. And like I said, uh, drive throughs done some really good information on it. Um, they have a list of, in fact, successful, uh, successful prices, and um, it tops out at around uh, 20 bucks, uh, 1999 specifically, because mm. they actually have the metrics that prove that that X, that 99 cent trick, uh, does actually get you more sales. Yeah. Um, but, uh, the, the stuff that costs 20 bucks, something to keep in mind, the Genesis core rule book itself is only 20 bucks to buy on drive through. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and both shadow of the beanstalk and realms of Terranoth are only 25. Um, slightly more for a for books that are uh, have a lot more full color art and a lot more uh, writing that went into them mm. um so you don't want to probably you don't want to charge more than the core rule book and you honestly don't want to charge more than the uh um, than the professional products that have come out yeah. um so i would recommend people keep their uh keep their price points below that um set their price point sort of based on how many pages of content you have, how much, uh, how much materials in it and how much you, uh, and how much you think somebody's going to get out of it. A full setting with all the character options, the adversaries, um, that kind of stuff hmm. you can definitely charge a little more for, hmm. um, a pack of, uh, a pack of like new starting character options or here are, 20 monsters and the, of generic fantasy you probably want to charge less for maybe only a couple dollars mm-hmm. um so that they're easy to pick up so yeah figuring out the costs definitely is uh is something that uh, you'll have to think about and like i said there's some good advice on it mm-hmm. um also um one thing one thing i can say as a developer um don't discount the uh the power of good art and a clean, well-used layout. Um, like I said, we provide some out art packs, and there's a lot of uh, free-to-use um, Creative Commons and um, stock image art out there. Mm-hmm. Um, make your uh, make your product look kind of um, flashy, look attractive, mm-hmm. and also make sure it's easy to read. Don't uh, don't pack too much into a page. Um, use some paragraph bit breaks. Use some uh, heading breaks. Um, finally, uh, and on that vein, uh, get your stuff uh, reviewed and get it proofread. Mm. Um, nothing. Uh, I mean, there will always be mistakes in material mm. and <laughs> I feel terrible every time, uh, I catch something in a published product that, uh, that is a mistake and we have to fix it on a reprint. But, yep. uh, there's no way to avoid some mistakes, hmm. but you definitely want to get make sure that you clean up the worst of them. Yep. Um, and you'd be surprised how useful just having a friend sit down and read through the whole thing can be. Hey, yep. you'd be surprised at how setting it aside for for a week and then coming back to it after you haven't thought about it yes. and reading through it again. Yep. How yep. many mistakes you can catch? Yeah. Yeah. Um, take. Take that extra few days, get that friend, hire a, um, a freelance proofreader if you have the money mm-hmm. um, and a lot of and you may not. And I totally get that. But review your stuff. Yep. Um, if you uh, if you have a really devoted fan group, play test your stuff, mm-hmm. bring it out in your game and uh, see how it plays before you uh, publish it. Mm-hmm. Um, the stuff that uh, the stuff that has the extra work that goes into it it's going to show and um, the reviews are going to reflect that and your fans are word of mouth and your fans are going to encourage other people to use it and buy it. Mm, It's also worth noting listeners that both the topics of uh, creative Commons zero CC zero and, and sort of free public domain art um, as well as the best ways to go about play testing your creations are both going to be topics that we will be covering in future episodes of the forge podcast. Definitely. Definitely. Awesome. I think that's going to be incredibly valuable information for your listeners. Hmm. 
Exactly. All right. So um, can you tell us a little bit, because we've talked about, um, you know, uh, how people can submit, um, you know, what the process behind the, the scenes are. But for those people who don't necessarily feel confident with um, producing their own material, but are really keen to get some of the material that's coming out. Can you tell us a little bit about what sort of content is available right now? Yeah, because yeah. you guys, when, when you announced this yesterday, you didn't just leave us in the dark. We got some launch <laughs> stuff, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, one of the uh, one of the things we wanted to launch with, and this is... This is uh, on the very, um, very valuable advice of um, one bookshelf. Um, we uh, we re- reached out to some uh, people that we uh, we've worked with in the past um, that we know are big fans of Genesis and asked them if they wanted to spend some time uh, creating some material that uh, would be basically live on the uh, on the marketplace when we launched it. Yep, and I'm. Ha- Talking to uh, talking to somebody who worked on it right now, um, Chris. Obviously, <laughs> you have a product that is uh, live on it. That uh, I, I the, do. I the do familiar my, my, setting. My familiar setting, which you actually got the chance to get on the table in its alpha stage um, <laughs> before any of us knew anything about the foundry. Yeah, it was uh, it was hard for me to keep my mouth shut at that point. <laughs> 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 um. But, uh, yep, so Familiar is definitely one of them. Um, Phil Mayuski and his, uh, and his friends created uh, Starcana, the, uh, the sprawling science fiction fantasy space epic. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm certainly glad that they uh, kept their, uh, kept their uh, goals realistic when they uh, set out to do that. <laughs> Well, they have to leave room for expansions, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> um, shoot, let's see. Uh, there's uh, quite a few adventures, which I think is really cool because yes. we haven't, um, besides the free adventures we've provided on our website, we haven't done a whole lot of adventures for Terranoff or uh, for um, for Android. And so Scott's got a uh, adventure... Um, Scott Zumwalt, who you mentioned, he's got an adventure for Android. Um, uh, Darren West has an adventure for uh, Terranoth, which is particularly creepy. Um, to read through <laughs> a little bit of that. Um, we also got some, some bigger freelance names, too. I know uh, Sterling Hershey. Mm. Yes, uh, that's right. And we can't, uh, and, and we he, can't forget Mr. Capel. <laughs> and I was going to say, well, we're going to be, we're going to be, we're going to be actually talking to Mr. Capel here in a little bit. Indeed. But, uh, yeah. I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to uh, spoil his uh, his thunder here. But uh, Keith's uh, Keith thing uh, is kind of a labor of that's been a labor of love for him for uh, quite a while now. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, geez, let's see. Chris Chris Hunt um, has his stuff up. Um, he uh, <laughs> um, his is kind of a w- interesting little weird war one. Um, Great module. Great Absolutely adventure. fantastic, yeah. yeah. Some of us got the chance to, to again, also play test it in its early alpha stages mm. before any of us knew anything about uh, the Forge, and yep. it was a blast. Mm. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, Kat, like I said, um, like you mentioned, she's got her adventure. Um, um, and a lot of this stuff is... Um, and, um, and then more people have stuff that's... Get, oh, John, of course. Um... Uh, um, John Dunn did his uh, interest, really interesting uh, um, extra be- like they're basically um, it's extra um, extra player um, options, um, but uh, but like animals, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like frog people and uh, minotaurs <laughs> and stuff, badger people. Yeah, that one's really cool too. <laughs> I know a few badger people. (laughs) (laughs) Interestingly, they bother me. Um, (laughs) And Tim, um, and if you get a chance to talk to uh, Tim Huckleberry, he can really go through a lot more of the, uh, the in-depth 
uh, basics of um, how all this stuff came together because uh, he was working with everyone um, hand in hand to uh, get those CPDFs created. So uh, I don't. Um, he can go into it even more, um, even even more in the future. Absolutely. Or you can just go over to the Foundry and download that stuff right now. Mm, that is true. Because hopefully we'll get um, Tim on our next show to uh, to talk about exactly that. That's the plan. I hope you. I hope mm. you get the chance to for sure. Mm. So, how often is new content going to be available uh, on the Foundry? Um, basically, whenever people upload it. Um, this is this is your marketplace in the general sense. So um, we don't uh, we don't control uh, who puts stuff up. I mean, we do control it if it uh, turns out to be uh, something offensive or uh, or inappropriate. Um, another thing that goes without saying, but I'll just say it also. Um, didn't say it before, but our terms of use also do cover stuff that's. Uh, like particularly offensive or otherwise inappropriate or really distasteful. So, um, you know, if, if it's something that you would feel embarrassed having your name on or, uh, or is, um, is otherwise super, super awful, Mm. you're not going to be able to sell it. We're, we're going to take that down. So, you know, probably stay away from that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and that, those conditions, uh, those sorts of things that you're talking about are clearly spelled out um, on the website. Yes, they are. Yeah. Cool. But, um, yeah, it's um, whenever people want to upload stuff, um, there will be new stuff on the Foundry. Very good. So, yes, yeah, so everybody get um, get those fingers going on, uh, on your um, typewriters, computers, whatever it is that you use. Um, and if you use a typewriter, my hat is definitely <laughs> off to you. <laughs> so I'm just showing my age. Um, <laughs> you, you've accomplished technomancy to a very strange degree. Um, and now I'm thinking of a new Genesis supplement. Mm. Technomancers? Uh, uh. <laughs> Technomancy okay, so, is a role playing game. <laughs> Technomancy. So last last found your related question for you, Sam, because you've been kind enough to give us uh, about an hour of your time at this point. Um, and this may be kind of a, a, a silly question because those of us who, who, I mean, we ourselves who have been involved in, in the creation of this content, um, we know that the majority of this content was not even finalized until, you know, just July, really. Um uh, some of it earlier, uh, however, have you had yeah. the chance to get any of this initial foundry content on the table yet? So I haven't gotten a chance to use it, but I've have gotten a chance to play in it a lot of it before it became um, of, before it became official foundry content mm-hmm. because some <laughs> of the it. stuff's been rattling around people's brains. You mentioned before that I got a chance to um, play in your familiar setting um, this year, which was damned fun uh, <laughs> and uh um Huli, obviously uh you and i were playing in it together with yes. your uh with my with rat. Your ridiculous <laughs> rat voice <laughs> and i not insulting <laughs> you here everyone i just want you to know um ian was actually playing a sentient rat so <laughs> <laughs> and I was playing a snake, so I was trying to do that <laughs> the whole time, and I'm sure it's getting on everyone's nerves. <laughs> oh no, it was, it was fantastic. It was, it, it, yes. And and for those for those for those who, are, who haven't already gone and looked, my, my familiar setting is an entire setting about playing as familiars, as yep. actual familiar animals. Yep. So, Ian, can you treat us to Orson's voice? I still remember it. It's been months, but I still remember it. <laughs> oh God. Yeah, so it's kind of like this, you know? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, a New York accent I cannot do, but that's that's my <laughs> best attempt. <laughs> but it was the commitment. It was the commitment you had to it, man. You just, you, 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 seriously, you know, any, any normal person would have done it for like five or six minutes and then be like, I can't keep this up. Not Huli. Four hours in, it was, it was, that was commitment. You, you owned it. It was beautiful. I am not saying that sarcastic. Uh, it was okay. actually incredibly enjoyable yeah, to it was, role it was, play with both of you. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Mr. Hunt's uh, game, um, Mr. Hunt's uh, adventure, I actually got to play in when he first uh, 
scribbled some notes down uh, two <laughs> years ago. Yep. To uh, to run the uh, run the adventure. Um, his uh, weird war, Nazi scientists, uh, magic aliens, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so I got to play to that in Gamer Nation two years ago, and that yeah. was super fun. Um, I think it's brilliant that he turned it into an act like an actual written adventure yeah. especially considering he was literally just writing notes down on the fly as he went um <laughs> and then um i have gotten to play one game of starcana with uh phil and his whole crew um and that one is a true gl- group collaboration i just keep saying uh, phil's name because uh <laughs> well, he's the guy he's, he's the, the guy you know <laughs> yeah he's, he's, he's the, the guy, guy he's you know. the it's face of they, it and it's interesting. They m- much as and we can we'll be talking about this in episodes of the, of the Forge as well. Mm-hmm. But much as I created my own sort of publication label for this work, which is Silhouette Studios, um, uh, uh, that whole crew from New England who obviously created Starcana, they created their own um, uh, publication studio, basically, which is Studio Four Hundred Four Games. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can just you can just call them the Four Hundred Four Crew. <laughs> the Four Hundred Four Crew. There we go. And <laughs> super cool. Um, so, yeah, I've gotten a chance to try all of those, um, and I've gotten a chance to read over a lot of um, everyone else's other stuff, mm-hmm. uh, and um, there, I think there's some other stuff that I don't know, um, that I haven't gotten a chance to check yet if it's uh, made it up on uh, online or not, but um, hopefully if it... So if I didn't mention someone's name, I super apologize, and I just didn't want to spoil your surprise in case uh, you needed another week to get it uh, um, polished up. Because (laughs) obviously with uh, Gen Con, with all the announcements that have been going on, um, I haven't had had five minutes to look at anything right now. (laughs) Oh, good. Oh, good. Well, yeah, so um, lots of content that uh, that you can download and uh, to use in your game uh, that's going to be available um, or is available right now on the Foundry and, and uh, obviously for the content that uh, will no doubt forthcome after that uh, will be available there as well. So, um, yeah, if... Uh, if you are a listener out there and uh, you have an idea that you really want to put forward into the Foundry, um, by all means, follow those guidelines. Um, you know, send questions to us. If you have any, uh, I'm sure we can point you in the right direction, if nothing else. Um, and, uh, yeah, it'll be really looking forward to, to seeing what people come up with. So, um, so yeah. Well, Sam, we want to thank you uh, for your time tonight. Uh, we we know that you're an incredibly busy person uh, with all the projects that uh, that FFG have got going on, and obviously with with uh, with Gen Con. I know that um, uh, neither or none of us have basically been able to get uh, out to the show, but um, yeah, we've been watching the live streams and uh, the Twitter and everywhere else that. As each year that Gen Con rolls around, my Facebook feed is just filled with um, all the stuff that I wish that I lived on the other side of the planet for. So, uh, <laughs> so. you and me, <laughs> all of us are there. <laughs> yes, yeah, only a few hours away. But yeah, but thank you very much for coming to the show, Sam, um, and uh, thank you for Genesis uh, as well as the Foundry. Um, so thank you very much for uh, for your time tonight. Uh, and for all of the the great stuff that you do for us. Hey, thank you both um, for uh, having me on. I mean, it's a real honor to be on your inaugural show. And I, let me just say, I think this, uh, I'm really excited to see where this show goes. I think it's really cool. Cool. Yeah, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right. Thank you, Sam. All right. Y'all have a good one. Well done. I love Sam, and he's so good to listen to. <laughs> I'm going to fanboy about him a bit, um, but also he's such a good sport. <laughs> yes, yes, he is. Uh, I, I've, I've, I, you know, the the amount of time that he dedicates um, of his own volition and his own free time, yep. um, just to us, the fans, the community at large, is is staggering. He is quite a fellow. So thank Indeed. you, Sam, again. Yeah. Indeed. And hopefully we'll have Sam on the podcast at a later stage. I'm sure that he would, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see where that goes. But anyway, <laughs> now 
As we mentioned, we have another special guest um, to kick off the inaugural uh, episode of The Forge. Um, and uh, we're going to um, have more um, special guests in this segment um, in the future. Uh, and we'd like to call this segment Breaking the Mold. Breaking the Mold. Ah, so the Genesis Foundry is an exciting community of fan-created content for Genesis. New settings, new rules options, adventure and campaign modules, and much, much, much more. But some creators really go above and beyond. They subvert our expectations and truly break the mold with their work. Mm. This segment, our Breaking the Mold segment, is a regular segment each episode that will be dedicated to showcasing an exciting offering available right now in the Genesis Foundry as we separate the pure alloy from the slag <laughs> and point you to the best content out there. <laughs> Indeed. And if we, yeah, we apologize ahead of schedule for all the puns. No, we don't. Uh, <laughs> no, we don't. We really don't. <laughs> we really don't. <laughs> now, tonight's guest is a well-known industry professional. He's been a freelancer for FFG for over six years, a contributing writer on over 20 books. That's nuts. Um, but the man is a machine, uh, including the Star Wars role-playing game Genesis and Legend of the Five Rings. He is a respected member of the D20 Radio uh, community, uh, and uh, has been on your show quite a number of times too, Chris. Um, eight times. Eight, eight times. times. The, the man is a machine. Um, and uh, he's a person that I would like to consider as my mentor. He is D20 Radio's own Keith Keppel. Keith, welcome okay. to the show. Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank, <laughs> thank you for that warm, kind introduction. <laughs> that's totally fine. All right, so let's start the, the ball rolling. So what um, what do you do and who are you? Tell us a little sure. bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, so uh, I am, as you said, Keith Kappel. All the things you said, I guess, are true. <laughs> uh, but um, So I'm a freelance writer for Fantasy Flight Games, uh, and I guess anyone else, but, but not really. Pretty much <laughs> exclusively I've worked for uh, FFG. Uh, so they will hire me to write stuff in the books that you guys buy. A lot of Star Wars, a little bit of Genesis, hopefully more as we move forward. Yep. Um, I also run a school, which you're also familiar with, mm. the uh, uh, Adventure Writing Academy, mm -hmm. where um, I teach you how to steal my job. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, what else do I do? I bartend. I used to be in the Navy. Uh, and, you know, mostly I just sit at home by myself and write all day. That's my thing. Very good. Now, obviously, uh, our listeners are wanting to, well, I, I hope if they're listening to the podcast, they're, they're going to be wanting to, to be involved in the industry. So would you like to tell us a little bit about uh, the Academy? Sure. Uh, so Adventure Writing Academy is a, uh, a year-long program that meets once a month, and that one night a month for four hours, you will be engaged in a uh, intense, fun, weird insane uh, kind of writing workshop uh, where my wonderful teacher, Maggie Ritchie, uh, will guide us through uh, some discussion, some live readings, and uh, uh, some, some sit down and take out your pens and pencils and let's start writing <laughs> uh, exercises. You've been through the program. You're one I of have, our, our grand success stories, as you well know, <laughs> uh, Huli. So uh, you could probably say about, almost as much about it as me, but uh, uh it's based on the same program I went through uh, in college at Columbia College Chicago. Maggie went through the same program as well. Right. She's much more educated. She got like a master's and a teaching certificate mm -hmm. uh, for the program. So she's far more qualified to teach the course than me. But uh, uh, it's based on that program. We've just applied it to uh, uh, genre writing, you know, like your sci-fi fantasy and that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. as well as uh, 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 heavy doses of RPG writing. Uh, sort of information. It's RPG writing is this weird, unique beast of uh, uh, a writing form that that really no school in America is going to specifically teach you how to write, mm -hmm. uh, or anywhere else, to my knowledge. But uh, uh, but it's a weird combination of like essay writing, uh, standard narrative, uh, a lot of second person point of view writing mm -hmm. there's like a lot of weird things that happen in rpg writing that don't happen in other forms of writing so 
uh, AWA Adventure Writing Academy uh, is a great place where uh, if you want to hone your skills for your own, you know, Genesis Foundry project or whatever, um, it, it's a great place where uh, uh, you can sort of work on some formal training if you haven't had any before mm-hmm. or some very, you know, genre specific training. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely recommend that uh, that course to anybody who's interested in getting into the industry or anybody who's into creative writing. It's uh, it's certainly, it challenges you, like uh, I can only speak for um, my experience, that uh, it, it certainly challenged me in a big way uh, with, uh, with the way that, um, you know, things are done. Um, having come from a very... Uh, a very much report writing background, um, you know, changing things around to uh, to to be more of that creative is is definitely something which um, is was unique. But I learnt so much from that, and Maggie is an amazing amazing teacher. Uh, so uh, so yeah, well done for the both of you. And how can people find out about that? Sure, uh, adventurewritingacademy dot com. Uh, you go there, there is a, uh, if you go to where our classes are and click and roll now, mm-hmm. you'll uh, uh, shoot an email over to me is what will happen in that form. And I will contact you back to make sure you're a real person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and once we have, I think it's uh, the threshold is uh, five or six. Once we have five or six students that are ready to go mm-hmm. the same day and the same time, we will uh, set a start date and we will begin class. Nice. Uh, the big, uh, the big cherry on top, uh, which I forgot to mention, mm. is we get the, the designer of, uh, you know, the narrative dice system, Genesis, if you will. Yep. Uh, Jay Little comes and does a, a four-hour talk, a four-hour seminar yeah. for our 11th course. So That was uh, that's always so exciting. eye-opening. So eye-opening. So, um, so yeah, he's, he's obviously been around the traps as far as um, his ability to be able to, to teach, that's for sure. Um, sure. So, uh, yeah, very, very good. So, Keith, a lot of our listeners may or may not be familiar with you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and specifically where did you get your start in the RPG industry? Uh, professionally, I started – actually, it's a funny story. I don't know if I've told this before, uh, but it just made me think of something. So Dave, Dave Gross, who uh, uh, is well-known for uh, uh, a lot of sort of uh, uh, D&D fantasy type of stuff. Mm-hmm. There was a period of time when Wizards of the Coast had the uh, uh, the Star Wars license. And Dave Gross was the managing editor for uh, the magazine, Star Wars Gamer Magazine, I believe it was mm. called. I remember that. And uh, uh, I sold. I sold an article to Star Wars Gamer Magazine. It was actually my first piece of work. I must have been like 17 or 18 years old. And, uh, um, you know, I was just uh, a random kid and uh uh i wrote what did it what was it, it was like a crimson empire mini source book oh. uh, crimson empire comics from dark horse comics yeah and so you know i did like five or six npc stats and maybe like one weapon or vehicle or something to that effect yep. and it was laid out in an article and he said hey i like this and uh uh he said yeah we're gonna put it in issue 13 unfortunately the magazine was canceled as oh. of issue 10 yeah <laughs> So that was my first near brush with professional publishing. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. But uh, uh, ultimately what happened was uh, Fantasy Flight Games put out an open call for fl- freelance writers. Mm-hmm. I was in a very fortunate position to have made friends with the uh, uh, the wonderful Sterling Hershey, who uh, uh, the D20 radio knows and loves. Mm. Uh, so I was good friends with Sterling. I'd been following him around like a lost puppy <laughs> at <laughs> two or three different uh, Star Wars celebration conventions, right. uh, knowing full well who he was, what he did for a living. Yeah. Or he's an architect for a living, but his, his side job is what I knew about, his Star Wars RPG writing. Mm. And uh, um, he was either being very nice or just wanted me to leave him alone and have a different focus. But he told me about this uh, uh, open call. He knew I'd gone to college for writing. Uh, and my buddy Ryan Brooks, who would ultimately go on to freelance for FFG as well, mm-hmm. uh, and he recommended we try out. We, you know, put our hat in the ring, as it were. Uh, so me and Ryan both filled out uh, some resumes and cover letters. And I think I wrote a submission. It was about a Rancor done in the uh, the Warhammer Fantasy Rules. And Ryan did the, uh, the Nexu. Wow. We traded and graded a lot and uh, then sent them in and proceeded to not hear anything for about a year and a half. <laughs> uh, 
and assumed it didn't work out. And eventually I got the wonderful call, uh, email actually from Sam Stewart mm -hmm. uh, to work on Sons of Fortune. And that was my first job, uh, Star Wars Edge of the Empire. There you go. That's a story. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> not, not bad. I was fully expecting to have to work my way up to uh, a Star Wars book, but they, they threw me right into the deep end of the pool Indeed. on the first job. Fantastic. That would have been a, a, an amazing experience to, to go through. And something that you're continuing to, to go through. How many how many Star Wars books have you been on? Man, I, I, off the top of my head, I'm not sure the exact number, but it's got to be like, it's well over a dozen for sure. Mm. It's it's probably closer to like 15 or 16. Uh, wow. and, and still more to come. I'm on the upcoming uh, Gadgets and Gear. Right. Uh, yeah, me and GM Phil were, I think, the only two writers on that book. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, still more Star Wars to come. Very uh, cool. Despite being a pretty mature game on. <laughs> yeah, because it's like, um, what, six years old now? Yeah, I mean, my it's as old as my, it's a little older than my career, I want to say. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, because my first book was Sons of Fortune, and that was like the first or the second, like, non-core sort of product yep. to come out. Yeah. Very good. So, um, now we've talked about your, your career, but what is your first love of Genesis? What do you like to get on the table when you play? Because obviously you're, you're extremely busy. I don't know how much gaming you actually get to do. But Almost when... <laughs> not. That's the answer to that question. Right. Uh, but, yeah, but... I don't like to leave my house and I don't like people to come over. <laughs> so um, that limits right away the amount of gaming opportunities I have. And I really, really, really love to work. Yep. Uh, I love playing. I love playing Genesis and uh, the Star Wars game that is Genesis Star Wars, I guess we could start calling it. Yep. Uh, so, but most of the gaming I do, um, I'm GMing and it's at conventions. Right. Uh, that's, that's like 90% of my gaming diet mm -hmm. at the moment. Uh, and I love I love running Star Wars. I love running Genesis. I love how uh, um, I kind of don't have to prepare at all, mm -hmm. so long as I have uh, dice, an adversary deck or two, and maybe some pre-gen uh, player characters. Uh, you know, I, I can grab any handful of people and say, mm -hmm. "Hey, we're going to play a game." Yep. Uh, so I, I love a lot of things about this system, mm -hmm. but uh, obviously. Uh, uh, Technically, Star Wars has to be my first love in the system, right? Right. Uh, I'm a giant Star Wars nerd. But uh, <laughs> I worked on Android, Shadow of the Beanstalk, yep. and uh, that's such a fun uh, setting as well. Uh, I'll be running some of that at uh, Gen Con. That's right. So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know that I have a first love of Genesis. I, I It's Genesis Core. I love that it exists. Yep. I love uh, uh, a lot of things about it. So. I'm pumped. Very good. I know that we are as well. And certainly about the, the announcement that has come out of uh, Gen Con just a few hours ago, I guess, um, which is the Foundry. So now you've got a product that uh, is coming out for the Foundry. Um, is that correct? That is true. Now, what is that? Would you like to tell us a little bit about it? I would love to talk about it. So um, the book I wrote is called Ready, Fight. And uh, it's an unarmed combat supplement for Genesis. So very cool. <laughs> so that's that's uh, that's the title. Uh, the main sort of like big things that it does it uh, it's designed for uh, two big things. If you want to run a campaign that is built entirely around unarmed combatants, mm. uh, it'll do that. So if you want to run like a kung fu setting in ancient China or a sort of like uh, Street Brawler, uh, Double Dragon, like Streets of Rage kind of beat em up uh, campaign. It'll do that sort of thing, too. So the, the main thing that uh, Ready Fight does is that uh, it, it creates a lot more like strategic and tactical, like mechanical options mm -hmm. for unarmed combat. Because uh, uh, I am a big like UFC fan, uh, mixed martial arts sort of fan, and just like fight sports fan in general. Yep. And... Uh, uh, one of the, the, I wouldn't call it a weakness, just one of the unexplored areas of Genesis uh, seems to be unarmed combat because the only, every single unarmed combat build in Genesis is probably going to be uh, brawn heavy and brawl heavy, right? Mm -hmm. And there's only one unarmed attack and something like seven 
talents maybe at the most that uh, sort of apply to unarmed attacks. And it just wasn't that there wasn't enough there to have a party of unarmed combat specialists yeah. and have them look different in any meaningful way. Mm-hmm. So uh, um, I split the brawl skill into two different skills, mm-hmm. uh, uh, striking and grappling. And uh, uh, they use different characteristics and there's some 35 odd talents and, uh, uh, you know, some new, uh, uh, new archetypes, new careers, uh, and a whole lot of like optional rules that you could use to add all sorts of different, uh, 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 options mm. and, and strategic depth to, to unarmed fighting and, and have it feel like you're sort of, uh, uh, in a real, uh, street fight or, you know, tournament fight like street fighter two or the UFC or, uh, even a, a pro wrestling match. Right. Mm. So, uh, that's what I did. It's, uh, 97 pages and it's up there on the foundry alongside everything else. So. Cause I've, I've managed to sneak a few peeks, um, over your development, um, uh, schedule sure. and yeah, it's, it's really, really good. And I'd recommend it for, for anyone. Um, particularly what you did with the, the brawl skill we were um, talking about at the start of the episode, uh, where, why that you would be using um, ranged light and ranged heavy um, and, uh, you know, uh, melee light and melee heavy and, and what the difference is with that. But we also mentioned that you can also split up other skills as well. One of the things that we were sort of suggesting is that if you have something like a, uh, a courtroom drama type thing like Legend of the Five Rings, for example, um, where social combat is such an important part that you might be splitting up negotiation perhaps into two separate ones. And you, you've done something similar. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know if you want to share that but uh, or let people uh, buy the product. Yeah, no, uh, I think splitting skills is something that's been uh, part of Genesis from day one, right? Mm-hmm. I think if you even look in the core rulebook, it talks about how optional it is uh, and when you should be uh, consolidating ranged or melee mm. and when you should be splitting it or pilot or, you know, there's a few skills that yeah. can optionally sort of uh, break apart. And I, I think what it comes down to, at least my interpretation, is uh, uh, if your campaign focuses on one skill a lot, mm-hmm. uh, it's going to benefit you, the GM, uh, and it's also going to give longer life to the campaign to split that skill up because mm-hmm. it creates – First of all, it gives people something else to spend XP in. Yep. And uh, it gives players a way to make their character look different than the person's next to them. Mm. Uh, if it's a huge part of the campaign, if it's like, well, you can't can't do this campaign without, uh, 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 you know, the survival skill or something because mm-hmm. it's an outdoor exploration campaign, then mm. it, and everybody's like, oh, man, well, you got to have three ranks of survival. It, that would make me immediately be like, oh, I should probably split survival up into like two different elements at least of what it means to to engage in a survival mm-hmm. campaign, right? Like maybe uh, uh, maybe uh, navigation is you know land navigation is completely different from uh, uh, from tracking or mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah, uh, you know wh- whatever it might be. But, yeah, you might split it up into like orienteering and foraging, for example. Right, right. There you go. That's a great split, too. Mm. So obviously there's no hard and fast way to how it's going to get split. Uh, That's going to be up to you at your table or whatever supplement you happen to be buying. But when I was looking uh, uh, for Ready Fight, uh, I saw that, yeah, man, uh, if I get about four or five people playing this and they get to build their own character, every character is kind of going to look very similar Mm. at at the start. Yep. Uh, so So a great way to change that was to split the skills up. And also something I did was uh, actually change one of the characteristics uh, from brawn to agility. So there's a a brawn uh, brawl skill, which is grappling Mm -hmm. and there's an agility uh, brawl skill, which is striking. So uh, and I think that's okay. There's nothing that says you can't do it. Mm. Uh, So that that's, that's sort of another thing to look at because if I kept it brawn, then immediately every single character, every single player that gets built in the system is going to go brawn heavy because it's by far the most important skill 
in these sorts of campaigns that deal with unarmed combat. Yeah. So uh, I didn't want that. I wanted a little more variety. So uh, I changed the characteristic as well. Mm. All right. So other than that, is can you sort of just to give us a glimpse of something exciting in your product, you know, whether to, to whet our appetite, is there any particular part that you're really, really happy with the way that it turned out? Uh, so I'm not going to lie. It's like my child. So I'm super <laughs> proud about every weird thing about it. But uh, one thing I'm glad uh, I feel like I made work was uh, uh, the meat of the book, if you will, outside of the mechanics, mm -hmm. is uh, we introduced four settings. And we introduced them sort of in the style that Genesis Core Rulebook introduced the settings. Mm -hmm. So um, we have like the tournament setting, which our tournament setting that we give you is called Trial by Fighter. And it's like this shadowy sort of Enter the Dragon Underground tournament, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, uh, the Street Brawler setting, and ours is called uh, Rumble City, uh, which is also great for uh, like street level superhero. Like if you wanted to do like a Marvel Netflix sort of campaign, yep. uh, Rumble City would be a great setting to sort of help you get started there. Mm. Uh, we also have a pro wrestling setting. Ours is called uh, Wrestling Heroes Championship. <laughs> And uh, uh, what's the other one? Oh, we have the, the Kung Fu setting, of course, the, the historical Kung Fu setting. And uh, um, ours is called Knights of Shaolin, I believe. Right. So, uh, uh, yeah, so we, uh, we have these four sort of really unique settings that I didn't know what I was going to do uh, individually for each one as I sort of got into the book. Yep. I, I really, like day one starting to write, I really already sort of knew what the, the core mechanical differences were going to be mm -hmm. and had a, a good sense of how that was going to work. But uh, the setting stuff kind of took me by surprise and had a sort of a life of its own while I was writing. And uh, uh, I was real happy with uh, the unique flavor sort of each one brings while still sort of adhering to this core theme of, of this book. Mm. Sounds very exciting. I, yeah, I think once we... Once everybody gets a hold of it, I think that they'll want to try to work out how to use it in their campaign. And I mean, that, that's obviously the aim of the exercise with this with these products is to allow people to uh, to use them. Forgetting the you know the creation of the product in the first place uh, aside, but you know uh, these sorts of things, I think, uh, and there's a lot of them are out there. But uh, yeah, I think yours is is certainly uh, one that is a must have. Can I just say? Oh, thanks. That's, uh, that's really nice to say. Uh, yeah, I mean, I worked really hard on it. It was, uh, uh, from the writing and development perspective anyway, it was a one-man show. Obviously, I had uh, a lot of help to turn it into a final art-filled product. But, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, there, there's just there's a lot of little stuff in there that uh, came out of uh, my love for, for watching MMA and uh, uh, you know all the the fight movies that you've seen, like Rocky or mm. uh, uh, you know uh, the the Last Dragon or you know Rumble in the Bronx with Jackie Chan or any Jackie Chan movie or any <laughs> Jet Li movie. Yep. Uh, so you know there's a lot of that sort of stuff where uh, uh, I managed to sort of sneak like a little homages in there. Like I have a tree for improvised weapon mastery, which was clearly thinking of. Uh, Jackie Chan, and uh, there's a, just a ton of, of little stuff like that. Mm. Uh, the montage rules, the, the training encounters. Yep. Uh, I, have a, I have rules to structure sort of these these training montages like uh, that Rocky made famous, right? <laughs> uh, and there's a way to, you know, set them up and give that sort of vibe and give players XP, and I'm real proud of how that worked out. Yep. So, the, yeah, there's a lot of, like, fun little uh, tributes. It's kind of a, a love letter to to uh like just fight movies boxing movies that sort of stuff yeah yeah that's amazing yes oh, everyone basically go out and uh, and get this particular product um and, and what's it called again keith it's ready fight ready fight with an <laughs> exclamation point yeah so cool <laughs> so keith as a, a seasoned freelancer and writer um and obviously initial foundry contributor do you have any suggestions yourself for anyone wanting to write for the foundry yeah man uh i mean there's several so uh the first thing i would say is uh, uh it's new foundry is very new mm. and genesis as a despite the wealth of star wars information out there um 
otherwise there's what is it there's just android and Terranoth, right mm-hmm. so um it's it's young as far as like what it supports at the moment mm-hmm. so if, if it were me sitting in your shoes listening to this thinking oh man i'm gonna get something on foundry of mine i would look for sort of an underserved uh niche of of genesis and mm-hmm. And and try to sort of stake out uh, a claim on, on one of these sort of uh, uh, types of settings that that hasn't really been covered by someone else yet because mm. there is a lot of the first yet to happen, right? Mm. Um, I'd also say whatever you do, play test, run what you've built before you put it up. Mm. Uh, uh, it, 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 things are less helpful to the community if they're not tested and balanced already. Yep. yep. Uh, uh, I would also say uh, find some friends that are familiar with laying out PDFs and that can draw. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. that's that's uh, always a challenge uh, when it comes to, to building something like this when your only background is in writing stuff. Mm. Uh, so yeah, I would say I would say start there and and do something you, you really know a lot about and you love. Mm. Uh, that's part of what drew me to Ready Fight was that I've watched you know, I've been watching the UFC pretty regularly for, I don't know, a decade or longer. It used to be something me and my dad did together a lot. Yep. And uh, uh, so, so it's something I was really educated on already. Uh, so, so I would say try to pick something that you have like a take on. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, something you have some some sort of experience or education about, and, and steer it in that direction. Absolutely. Otherwise, hey, if you got a homebrew setting and you just want it to be up on the foundry. Man, have at it. Put it up there. Uh, show it. Show the world. I think that's great too. Absolutely, and I think that that's something that I know that Sam has mentioned. But get things proofread. Um, sure. You know, even something from that I know that you've suggested to me in the past is that get everything that you you've done uh, down on paper, and then walk away for a couple of days, and then come back with it with fresh eyes. And uh, that can make a huge difference as well. But certainly throw it past, you know, a good friend who, you know, maybe has done that sort of proofreading before, or just to to get another couple of set of eyes uh, across the uh, across your work um, can do it wonders. Yeah, uh, I 100 percent agree. In fact, something I, I often say is that uh, I, uh, part of the big reason I'm uh, as competent at what I do today with regard to writing and game design as I am, is that when I first started in like 2005, really, uh, when I started fandom comics, which is sort of this fan star Wars RPG comic book fiction site that I used to do. I did it with my buddy, Ryan Brooks, and we were both sort of interested in getting our name one day in a professionally published star Wars book. (laughs) And, uh, uh, we were, you know, at about, we had different strengths for sure. He was actually, uh, grammatically way further ahead than, uh, of me at the time. Right. And uh, uh, probably still is, to be honest, with like the hard and fast grammar rules. Mm. But uh, uh, we would trade in great, man. He was like my writing. Uh, I would I would fall just short of calling him my writing partner, but he was he was my peer editor and I was his. Mm. And uh, uh, anytime we'd write something, it'd be trade and grade it to death until it sounded to our ear like, what professional writing should sound like. Mm. Uh, and, and we did that for eight years, I want to say. And, and that really made me much better at writing. I, I didn't necessarily know why something was a rule mm. uh, at that time, but I knew there was a rule and it, should, it shouldn't sound like that. Yep. It should sound like this. Mm. Uh, and, and I learned a lot of that the, the hard, slow, long way uh, <laughs> uh, with Ryan Brooks. And then I went to college and things you know accelerated at a even faster pace yeah absolutely. Uh, at some formal training but get get a get a writing get someone whose work you can read and that, who will read your work mm. uh and and give you honest critique uh and that you know won't offend you or that you won't offend but that that it could just be about the work yep and making it better mm. uh and if you find that that's that's worth more than you know anything else in this business i would say early on in your sort of aspirational career totally agree totally agree all right lastly gotta say and ask if you can tell us <laughs> what's next for you what's next is uh, a good question uh 
uh, at the point of this airing, it's probably uh, uh, another game to run at Chen Con, to be honest. Right. But uh, uh, I, I think my next release is going to be Gadgets and Gear. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the only other thing I have announced at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, although there are uh, a lot of plans, which uh, it might be a little too early to announce any of those. Fair enough. But there are plans for follow-ups to, to Ready Fight. Uh, uh, complimentary products and stuff like that that I'm hoping to put up over the course of the next year yep. on the Foundry. Uh, uh, and, you know, if people like Ready Fight and, and like one of the settings in particular, any of the four, if there's if there's one that sort of uh, 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 emerges as the, the most popular, I'd really like to do uh, uh, a full setting book just for one of those that mm -hmm. sort of further expand some of the ideas presented in the court and in, in ready fight uh, along that sort of narrower scope. Mm. I'm voting for WWE. Um. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, Wrestling Heroes Championships. Yeah. WHC. WHC. <laughs> uh, sure. Which, yeah, was put in there with a big wink and a smile. I think there were honestly only about six months of my life where I was obsessed with wrestling and I was, a very young child, but, uh, um, but it felt like I, I knew it was something popular and I knew it would fit in this. Mm. Uh, so I watched, I watched a fair bit of wrestling in the past three months, mm -hmm. uh, just to get a feel if it's really changed much from what I remember. And while it's much more polished now, it really has not changed much no. since when I was <laughs> a child. So I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. I know what this is about. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it was fun. It was really fun. And I think maybe of all the settings, uh, that one probably has the most, as it should, the most uh, uh, elaborate and fun sort of backstory nice. uh, leading into it. There's there's a lot of a lot of melodrama in the world of wrestling. So. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun to write. Indeed. All right. Well, Keith, thank you very much for coming on to the show, uh, this our inaugural episode. Uh, and talking about uh, what you've uh, got in the pipeline and uh, obviously what uh, is now uh, ready for download <laughs> from uh, from the Foundry. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're very oh. happy that you can make it onto our first show. Keith, as always, it's been a genuine pleasure. Thank you. Uh, honored. Honored to be on the, uh, the first episode. So that was amazing. Keith is a bit of a legend, um, and we're so happy he could make it on to our first show, so thank you again, Keith. Um, Word. That, yeah, he's just, yeah. I can't speak more highly uh, about Keith. He's just, as I said, a bit of a legend as far as I'm concerned. All right, so um, hopefully we'll have a few more, um, and we certainly do have planned, um, to have people um, that um, come on to Breaking the Mold to talk about their work. So if you are a, uh, a person who's uh, got your work <laughs> put, on to the, uh, put on to the foundry, um, we want to hear from you. Let us know. Uh, send us an email to forgegenesis at d20radio.com. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll take banners from there and um, hopefully get you on the show. All right, so that's that segment underway. Um, we've hopefully you've enjoyed that. Um, but now we'd like to introduce you to another segment, which is called Under the Hammer. Under the Hammer. Welcome to Under the Hammer, the segment where we will answer your games and rules questions about the Genesis role playing game as it impacts both rules and content creation, and of course, play. Now, this episode, we've got a couple of questions to get us started. Chris, would you like to read out our first question? I certainly can. Uh, this comes from the illustrious Darth Zorg, mm. who asked the following. When is the best time to break the rules creating adversaries? Minions, rivals, and nemeses. And he's specifically referring to uh, Core Rulebook page 202, creating adversaries. Mm. So when is the best time <laughs> to... <laughs> That's a deep question for the first one. Um, yeah. <laughs> so when to break the rules? What does he actually mean by that, I wonder? Um, hey, well, yeah. I've, I've only ever had to do it once. Right. Um, well, well, twice. twice. Okay. Tell us about that. 
Well, and they both had to do with magic or, or a derivative of magic. Um, right. uh, my my familiar setting that's actually on the um, uh, on the on on the foundry right now. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you have NPCs that are are going to be using magic because magic is a big part of that setting. Mm. Um, and then additionally, anytime you uh, you uh, you know bastardize the magic rules for something else, I have another uh, a product that's being developed right now, um, which deals with superheroic powers, mm. um, which are very much based off of the core mechanics of the the, the magic system. Yep. Um, and I, I had to do the same thing there. And in both instances, it was a case of where I have minions and rivals that I would like to have magical capability, meaning that they need to cast spells. Mm. Well, can you can you guess what the inherent problem with that is, Huli? Because minions can't spend strain <laughs> for a start. Correct. <laughs> and rivals, they can, but it's going to affect their wounds. It's going to affect their wounds, yes. Um, <clears throat> so... You know, with Nemesis, not a problem. They're built the same way players are. So yeah, I actually had to. I had to include in a familiar. You'll actually find a sidebar in the adversary section, uh, specifically talking about modifying the rules for this. That basically, I had to do two things. Um, uh, the first of which is I had to say, look, for for minions uh, who have magical capability, yeah, they can voluntarily spend strain, and it just goes against their wounds. Hmm. Um, uh, and for both minions and rivals, I had to make a recommendation, and you'll notice this in the stat blocks. Um, actually, that I have in as, because of this, I have increased their wound thresholds mm-hmm. by about four points higher than what I would normally put it at. Mm. Um, because basically, that gives them the ability to fire off two spells without messing with the standardized stat block they would normally have. Yep. So, in other words, it's, it, they're going to suffer four wounds to do that, basically. Mm. Um, does that make sense? It does, absolutely. Well, yeah, it's the only time I've ever had to modify the rules. Hmm. Look, the just using that as an example, I've not had a lot of magic on the table, but I know that I've certainly taken that into consideration. And one of the things that we talked about, um, and look, we looked at it when we were developing um, Knight's Edge, that um, that we would have a specific special ability that only applies to certain minions that they cost uh, the spending the 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 strain cost is actually reduced by one they're minions then it's not as though that it's going to break the game um, uh, but there are certain things that you can do that uh, that do go outside of those rules um, uh, when it comes to using adversaries the other thing to take into consideration when looking at adversaries um, is that they don't have the same rules applied to them that PCs do. They don't have right. to have X number of first-tier talents before they can get onto a second one um, or onto their, their T2 talents. They have whatever talents are going to be appropriate for their uh, for the purpose that they, they're going to play in your setting or in your game. So yeah, that, that doesn't. It can basically go. You can do whatever you want. Ultimately, it's not as though that Sam's going to come down and knock on your door and and say, "Hey, look, you know, you're doing it wrong. It's it 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 doesn't work like that." That's not what this game is about. As long as you're applying some level of balance to your game, um, you should be fine. Absolutely. And, you know, Darth Zorg's question was, when is the best time to break the rules? Um, as little as possible. I mean, uh, when you're creating custom content, and this will be a theme we constantly come back to, mm-hmm. you are better off when you are creating something from whole cloth. You are better off using as much of the existing rules as humanly possible, mm-hmm. always. If, if, you, if you have a choice of either creating something new or reskinning something that's existing, always Always to 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 I mean always reskin the existing if it will fit your needs. Agree. Um, you know the the only time you should ever break those rules, especially when it comes to adversaries, and this this adversary creation methodology and this th- these mechanics have been so well play tested mm. and so well defined and validated. The only time you should ever do it is in those incredibly rare circumstances, like I brought up, mm. um, where the existing rules won't fit the setting. Yeah. Okay. Um, and even then you should, 
never do anything radically drastic. Hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, that's 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 really what it comes down to. Yeah. But you also bring up a really valid point, Huli. I mean, you know, when it comes to adversaries, typically, especially when it comes to well, for everything, they they break the rules on their own. Hmm. Um, they they have they have talent options that are not available to, to player characters. They can take a, a fifth tier talent with nothing else if you feel it's appropriate. Mm-hmm. Um, you know their very nature tends to kind of break the rules. Absolutely, and probably the 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 thing that adversaries and and I've said this quite a number of times is that there is nothing in the rules, although that some people say that there are, there is nothing in the rules that says that minions can't have talents. For example, if you want to have a bunch of ninjas that are just coming out en masse, so you want them to be, you know, you want to have a minion group of four or five ninjas, but you don't want them to be dispensed with very quickly, give them a couple of ranks or or one rank in adversary. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, it it makes them last that little bit longer and allows that little bit more fun at the table because you're going to get occasionally some despairs. But it makes them so much more intimidating, even if it's just from a a psychological perspective. So, um, so yeah. The other thing that that I'd like to raise as well when it comes to uh, to minions and rivals and, and nemesis is that... There is also special abilities. We can't <laughs> sort of... Uh, one of the things that, you know, it's it's easy to say, right, well, I'm going to pick this talent, I'm going to pick this talent. But perhaps that no talents really suit what you're trying to do with that particular character. And I know that a lot of the Star Wars um, uh, setting books that have been coming out, like Dawn of uh, Rebellion, uh, as well as uh, the the recent Clone Wars books, is that all of the stat blocks for major NPCs that we see in the the different shows, they don't want to have four pages worth of stat block. They just know that they do something specific that really speaks to the type of character, and so they'll give them a special ability. And I think that that's something that you should really consider when designing your minions and rivals. And there really is nothing in the rule book about how to do that. So, you know, just obviously, again, look at balance, but that's something to consider as well. Yeah, and honestly as well, it sounds like we're going to see a little bit more rules around adversary design Yeah, uh, absolutely. With, with the expanded book, core book that's about to be released. Mm, from what Sam said, definitely. Yeah, so that'll, yeah. Be, that'll yeah. be exciting to sort of see what additional things that you can throw into the mix there so yeah my last thought on this Mm. is don't don't be afraid to beg borrow and steal the best thing that i would pilfer uh to use that could solve a lot of problems to sort of break the core rules Mm. um is actually a suggestion that was uh, a, a rule that was written for the Star Wars role playing game by, by FFG uh, mm. by our, our wonderful guest we just had with us, Keith Kappel, mm. um, that was made available in the book uh, recently released, The Rise of the Separatists. Yes. Um, and this was the, uh, the, the rules for droid phalanxes, mm. um, which can be applied honestly to any set of minion groups and is a fantastically uh, brilliant set of rules for anyone wanting to impart a endless wave of minions on a battlefield mm. and still let PCs be whole hogs who take on an entire battalion basically mm. and and without being completely imbalanced and can actually be successful. Um, very interesting rules so go check mm. those out. Indeed. All right, so we have another question which um, this time is coming from Veronica Leonard. And she asks, uh, what are your thoughts on character motivations, such as strengths, flaws, desires, and fears, and how a player in a GM uh, might best utilize them in-game? They seem to be a version 2.0 of the obligation mechanic from Star Wars, but my players seem to grasp this mechanic much more easily than a GM trying to incorporate obligation into the story. What are your thoughts? Oh wow! See, I've always I've always encountered the opposite problem. I, I find that people grasp obligation more easily than the uh, the the uh, motivation mechanic um, in Genesis, hmm. mostly because obligation has this concrete, you know, from Star Wars has this concrete uh, 
uh, mechanic associated with it where you're rolling to see if it comes into play. Hmm. Um, my my thing, the, the the best way that I have found to work with the motivations in Genesis specifically, hmm. the, the, the strengths, the flaws, the desires, and the fears, um, is... It, it, this is this is total house ruling, but mm. I'm I'm willing, but holy, I'm willing to share it if if you if, if, if it has validity here. <laughs> oh, I think um, so. <laughs> okay, so this system has this wonderful thing called a boost die, mm. and the system also has a wonderful thing called a setback die. Mm. You are familiar with these concepts. <laughs> I am indeed. <laughs> All right, so this is how I've been doing it in my Genesis games, and it's been working remarkably well, Veronica, and yep. maybe it'll work for you. So let's talk about strengths, flaws, desires, and fears for a moment. Strengths represent an inborn positive capability for the character, hmm. okay? Um, a flaw is an inborn negative characteristic the character has. And desires and fears are things that are they don't, they're not quite in the same category. Some people say, oh, you know, they're like upgraded versions of strength and flaws. They're not, okay? Mm. A strength is a positive personality trait. A desire is a goal you want to achieve. Mm. A flaw is a negative personality trait. A fear is a outcome you wish to avoid, mm. okay? So they're, they're very different things. So let's talk first about strengths and flaws, okay? Mm. Not for every check, but I'll typically limit it to once, maybe twice a session. If I have a player who is playing to their strength, mm. all right, and is role-playing it well, and it comes into a check they are making, that is an excuse for a boost die. Mm. Consequently, if I have a player whose flaw would impact the situation they're in, that would provide them with a setback die. Um, to give you a... A, a, an example of that actually in play for me. Um, I had a player once whose whose flaw was anger. All mm -hmm. right, and they were in in a social encounter, um, and they were not doing too terribly well. And one of the players said, "Okay, I want to do this," and he made some rationed, reasonable response and a good argument. And he was going to roll charm, and I said, "That's great, but you're getting pretty pissed off. You're mm -hmm. getting really angry, and that's your flaw." And he just stared at me, and I said, so I want you to add a setback die to that check. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, for desires and fears, I do things a little differently. Mm -hmm. um, and this requires a little more planning on the part of the GM, but this is how I run it. Mm -hmm. Let's start with fear. I, I know what my player's fear, character's fears are, okay? I will find, not in every session, but usually one player per session, I will find a way to incorporate that fear into the adventure they're going to take, into that mm -hmm. session, mm -hmm. all right? If the player... So this is a little, this is a little meta. <laughs> if, the, if the player ignores their character's fear, mm. okay, then I will impose setback die on them during the scene. Yep. Does that make sense? It does. Okay? Absolutely. So... So I, I have I have a character who ha has a tr has a truly tremendous fear of humiliation. If go going back to that same social encounter example, hmm. if I say, "Yeah, you're not going to be comfortable doing this because you could be humiliated," hmm. isn't that what your character is absolutely afraid of? Um, he says, "Yeah, yeah," but and he he makes some nonsense justification <laughs> for why he, he's going to do what he wants to do anyway. Right. Uh, as a player, hmm. I say, "Okay, that's great," but you're going to be suffering a setback day. Yeah, yeah. Um. And then I do the exact same thing for strengths, just the, just the, uh, the, the opposite. Um, mm. it, it's one of those things that if you can find a way to um, – I, I use strengths to pit against difficult situation in game. Mm. Um, so, for example, um, I had a, a player once who had a strength of independent. Okay. Now, the way they were playing that, they played it as a strength, but it was almost kind of like a flaw. Mm. They, they wanted to do things on their own. Mm -hmm. um, well, the group was literally trying to sneak into in that game. I think it was a, I think it was it was Weird War. So I think it was like a Nazi stronghold. They were trying to sneak in, and they were yeah. trying to do it together. And the party's stealth monkey was going to make a group check for all of them at an increased difficulty. Yep. And I looked at them and said, considering your character's strength, would you really be okay with that? Mm -hmm. And he said, 
no, I, I really wouldn't. I would go alone. I wouldn't go in with the group. And he chose to go alone and go around because of his character's strength. I actually, because that put him at such a huge disadvantage because mm. he had no stealth capability, I actually awarded him two boost die for that choice. Mm. Um, just because he was playing to his character's strength. Yeah. That's a bit extreme. I mean, but one boost die is pretty standard. So anyway, that's a long rant, but th- that's how <laughs> I actually do this in my game. That's how I use it. I mean, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? Look, a lot can be taken from, uh, like before there, there was Genesis, um, I was involved in the, the playtest for Legend of the Five Rings, the, the latest yeah, version yeah. that came from Wizards of the Coast. And they use this heavily when it comes to strengths and flaws and desires and fears. Now, this whole segment actually came from Kat Ostrander, who was heavily involved in that. And that's the reason why in social encounters that you can, with advantages and whatever else, start to learn the, the, your opposition's strengths and their flaws and desires to then use against them. And the same thing obviously applies to NPCs who, you know, you might have your, your big bad who is really wanting to know, um, uh, you know, they're asking probing questions and they find out one of your desires. Well, they may get some boost die or, or there may be some setback die applied to the player when making an oppose check because they know what to be sort of throwing into the mix of the negotiation that sort of thing. So those, and and also that, and something else that that I know that um, that GM Huzz from the uh, from uh, from the dice pool has suggested in the past is when it comes to doing things like um, when they uh, when somebody gets a fails a fear check, and and these are in the rules as well, is that when they fail a fear check that they get another fear potentially on a despair. So those sorts of fears can be something that can, you know, you might have multiple versions of them Mm -hmm. and you may need to try to get rid of some of those fears through, and certainly in a Call of Cthulhu type sort of setting, that you would have people having to talk to a psychologist or, or whatever else and there may be some, different story aspects that can play into that as well. I find that motivations are probably one of the most fascinating things in the game. And certainly motivations is something that, that comes from Star Wars as well. Um, that, But it was a very specific motivation of why your character is a Jedi or why your character is a member of the Rebellion or, you know, why did it, what is it that you're trying to... Um, make money in the outer rim uh, when it comes to Edge of the Empire. But by spreading it out into these four different categories, it allows the the player to get a much clearer idea of what their character is like. So, um, so yeah, if, um, if Veronica's um, having um, great success with the way that uh, the way that the motivations are working for her game, fantastic. She's doing it right, ultimately. Agreed. And and a very very good question. So yeah, well, that unfortunately brings us to the end of our first show. Um, if uh, hopefully you've you've all enjoyed listening to us um, rabbit on and and our great interviews with both Sam and Keith. Uh, that uh, you've managed to get some information um, out of that. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to provide that to you in more um, over the next, or over however long we last, basically. (laughs) Uh, It's what it goes down to. But if uh, if you do have any questions you'd like us to answer, uh, like both Veronica and um, and Darth Zorg have, that's a crazy name, (laughs) Uh, as they've asked, basically, uh, whether it be about developing your own content for Genesis, uh, being a GM or a player, or general questions about the rules themselves, you can send us an email to Forge Genesis. That's F O R G E G E N E S Y S. So Forge Genesis at d twenty radio dot com, or you can post your questions to either Facebook or Twitter by searching at Forge Genesis. And if you're lucky. 
you might get your question answered here on the show. Also, be sure to join the even larger discussion on the D20 Radio Facebook group where we nerds congregate to cross-pollinate and talk about all of the, the different games that we play, um, all the different memes that JT decides to put up, and, <laughs> <laughs> and a whole heap of other things uh, about both Genesis as well as everything else. And don't forget to give us a like as well. Mm. Uh, reviews are important, so drop us one on your favorite podcaster, uh, iTunes, and of course, Facebook. Um, you can also visit us on our website at ForgeGenesis.com. And finally, you can find us on YouTube mm. by searching at Forge Genesis. Indeed. Well, I think that was a pretty great show for our first one, don't you, Chris? Not too shabby. Sam was amazing. Keith, too. The hosts eh, could use some work, though. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. All right, well, that's a wrap for us. Thank you all for joining us um, for listening, and we hope that you can join us uh, next time as we continue to explore the Genesis role-playing game with you. I'm GM Hooley. May your triumphs be many and your despairs be few. And I'm GM Chris, wishing you peace, love, and good gaming. And remember, the Forge Podcast, helping you hone your gaming edge. The Forge, a Genesis podcast, is a proud member of the T20 Radio Network. For more information about the network, visit www.d20radio.com. The Forge is a fan-generated podcast. All the information provided on the podcast, social media, and related website is not affiliated with Fantasy Flight Games or any of their licensors. The content of this podcast remains the property of the Forge, a Genesis RPG podcast, and is intended for educational and informational purposes only. The Genesis role playing game, Genesis logo, Genesis Foundry content, and all material remain the property of Fantasy Flight Games. All products available on the Genesis Foundry website remain the property of their respective companies and individuals. For more information about the Forge, a Genesis RPG podcast, visit www.forgegenesis.com. 